Good evening. Special greeting to um, those of you who have travelled. Who's travelled for a long way to come to this meeting? Out of Sydney somewhere. Where from? Right? Campbelltown. That's not out of Sydney. I, I... <laughs> Wollongong. That's good. Excellent. God bless those folks. Oh, you can't trick me. I know a bit about this place. Yes. So I want to say tonight, thank you very much again to Pastor Norman. Where is he? Just up there, is he? And to those of you in the overflow, good evening, everybody. You're not that bit, come on. Well, try it again. Good evening, everybody. No, the overflow. Good evening, everybody. No, be quiet. I'm listening to the overflow. I'm trying to hear the overflow call again. Once more, good evening, everybody. Oh, that was hopeless. <laughs> Anyway, praise the Lord. God bless. Those of you who have come for the first time tonight, we have the uh, books and so on and on the book table. They're selling out very quickly. So those of you who do not have opportunity to get them, we would suggest that you uh, get on the internet if you have a friend with the internet or you have it yourself. And this is our website address. So the books, tapes and so on are available there. Warning, second warning, final notice, P.S., better than Nostradamus, the devil's jigsaw, in which is the picture of the twin towers that we wrote, we drew uh, three and a half years before it took place. In fact, I'll show you. Here it is here. So I suggest that you get the devil's jigsaw along with better than Nostradamus, which has 25 reasons why America is mentioned in Bible prophecy. There it is. Notice the... Um, the Twin Towers, that you'll see the aeroplane flying, the word anthrax in the sky. All that was done three and a half years before the event took place. And I have newspapers and television people calling me from all over the world to know how I got that. It's all scriptural, you see. So we'll deal with a little bit of that tonight and some other things as well. So have your pen and paper ready, please. We have a good night ahead. Uh, if you'd like to subscribe to the Omega Times, our newspaper, we put this out every month. Seems to have lost it. It's... Uh, the Omega Times comes out every month with many, many articles in about Bible prophecy. We will bring you up to date. Please subscribe to that on a piece of paper with your address and phone number, and I'll take it back to New Zealand and send it to you. Anybody like to join us on the Israel trip this year? Middle East trip? Take the brochure with you, please. If everything looks all right, we'll go. Listen, I'm as keen to stay alive as you are. And if it looks a bit dicky, we won't be going. But if it's all right, we'll be going. So I'm, I've been asking the Lord, I've been 18 times already, and I've been asking the Lord, I want to be there when the peace treaty is signed. We're looking for a seven-year peace treaty between the Jews and the Arabs. There must be a seven-year treaty confirmed by a man called Antichrist. Your scripture for that is Daniel 9, 27. says this, He shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, which in the Hebrew language is the word heptad. And in the midst of the week, he will cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. If you look on the chart over there, look around gently, so you won't need to see a chiropractor after the meeting. <laughs> You'll see over there, 20, question mark, question mark. He will confirm the covenant with many, that's all the Arab nations and Israel, for seven years. Daniel 9, 27. In the midst of the week, he will cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. In other words, because he will be a non-religious Jewish uh, Antichrist, this man <clears throat> will help Israel and then halfway through he will break the covenant and then it says a very bad time is going to come. That's called the tribulation. The tribulation is not seven years in length, it is only three and a half and so therefore we reckon that on this, Noah was saved before the flood. Lot was saved before the fire. The believers will be saved before the tribulation. Good news. Now some of you don't believe that, so Praise the Lord anyway. <laughs> Some people believe Jesus comes before the seven years. If you believe that, you're a pre-tribulationist. Some people believe he comes in the middle. If you believe that, you're called a mid-tribulationist. Some people believe he comes after the seven years. If you believe that, you're called a post-tribulationist. I said to a friend of mine once, the funny thing is, each of these groups is perfectly sure that they are correct. And my friend said, of course they are, otherwise they join the other group. <laughs> 
So the question is, because each of these groups is perfectly sure they are correct, they all have Bible verses to prove the point, who is correct? The key word is wait. If you're still here three or four days after the peace treaty is signed, that's the end of that view. <laughs> wait humbly with me. <laughs> For halfway through, if Jesus doesn't come back there, I will have to write letters all around the world apologizing. And then we wait for another three and a half years. If he doesn't come there, we're doomed. <laughs> but the praise of the Lord, he is coming, everybody. Amen. And from the moment the peace treaty is signed, within seven years, he will come back again. That's the key to the whole deal. So please take those home with you. If you even if you don't intend to come, there's a picture of my wife and I on there. You might enjoy that. <laughs> I want to give a very special greeting tonight to a very uh, precious man of God here, Pastor Leo Polo. This man here started the Assemblies of God among the Samoans, and he's got 40 churches going in this country. He's done well for Jesus. Get up, brother, and let the people give you a clap. Yeah. And he's worked hard, and God has blessed him. And the other thing is, he's part of my family. So bless you, brother. Now, tonight, we're going to turn in our Bibles in just a moment. But before we do, I want to say this, that when you travel around like I do, you've got to keep yourself in shape. That's why I, I really appreciate those of you who go to the gym. Is there anybody here who works in the gym? Where are you? God bless, only one person. <laughs> when you travel like this, we can't, you see, we can't go to gymnasiums, that's impossible. So my grandmother, at the age of 65, began to walk five miles every day. Now she's 87, we don't know where she is. <laughs> Now, <clears throat> I see a lot of young people here tonight. It's nice to see young folks here. Who's under the age of 30, please? Now, if you're taking notes, write this down. This is sensible, what I'm saying now. My father told me this. By the time you reach the age of 30, make up your mind what you're going to do. Because Jesus was 30 when he started his public ministry. The first 30 years of preparation to decide what you're going to do. So make sure you set your sails in the right direction and God will bless you. Praise God, everybody. I heard of a young university student who rang his father one day. He said, Dad, he said, I'm almost finished university. I'm graduating next week. And he said, I'd like uh, to have a motor car. There's an unwritten rule in this university that the moment somebody graduates, Dad buys them a car. I need wheels. That's what he said. So the father said, I'll, I'll buy you a car, son, on two conditions. Number one, that you get all A-grade passes. And number two, you get a haircut. <laughs> so the next week came and the boy rang up. He says, Dad, I'm ready to go down Parramatta Road to get a car. And the father said, OK, son. He said, have you fulfilled the conditions? The boy said, I've got all A-grade passes. And he said, yes, son, but I don't think you've had a haircut, have you? He said, listen, Dad, you read the Bible, and you know there are men like Abraham, Moses, and possibly even Jesus. They probably had long hair. And the father said, well, possibly that's true, son, but remember this, they walked everywhere. <laughs> Here we go. Everybody ready, please? Pens and papers ready. On the 12th of September last year, some of you will remember exactly where you were. It was the 11th in America, but because New Zealand is ahead, we're right on the international date line, and you folks are two hours behind us here. Uh, we were woken about 2 o'clock in the morning. A friend of mine called from the Gold Coast, and he said, turn on CNN. There's uh, something happened in New York. And so I turned on CNN, and my wife and I sat up and looked, and we watched. We saw the two planes coming. Now, one hit the tower, and then about an hour later, the other one hit the tower. And when I saw that happen, I heard the commentator mention the word one hour, and I shouted, Revelation 18. Turn with me, please. So we now turn to Revelation 18, and we read in chapter 18, verse 2. If you have a King James Bible, read with me, please. 
Here we go. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Now, if you were in the meeting last night, it's very difficult for me to do these meetings because some people only come for one night. It's a, and it's a series, you see, so the background is very important to understand. If you look at the Bible, you'll see that at a certain time in history, uh, there was a man called John who wrote down the book of Revelation. So very quickly tonight, I'll just call out some questions for you and you Bible students can answer. Here we go. Who was the author of the book of Revelation? I'll just, I'll put it up here then. We'll put God for a start. Now, we'll call it once more. Who was the author of the book of Revelation? Okay, and he gave it to? He gave it to Jesus. Now, we'll just ask, who did Jesus give it to? All together, please. The angel. Good. And who did the angel give it to? It's got to be John this time. Some people said John four times, so we... We will now turn to Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, and we will correct our theology. <laughs> Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, altogether, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass, and he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. So there were four people involved in the writing of the book of Revelation. Now, can someone tell me, please, the island he was banished to? Patmos, I've been there a number of times. We've preached this message on the beach at Patmos, which is in one of the Greek islands. I've stood on the beach exactly as John did when he saw these things revealed in a vision. Who can tell me the year the book of Revelation was written? Somebody, it's not a trick. 96 AD, thank you. And what was prophesied in 96 AD is happening in the year 2002. Our message is right up to date. Now, if you look here, let's turn to Revelation 17, and we're going to read a scripture there in verse 10, and I'm going to move fairly quickly tonight because there is just so much information. Revelation 17, 10. The Apostle John is writing in 96 AD under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, and God shows him that there will be seven very powerful empires that will run the Gentile world. So let's read together, shall we? Verse 10. And there are seven kings, five are fallen, and one is and the other is not yet come, and when he cometh, he must continue a short space. Now, some of you went to school. You remember while you were at school, you learned your verb tenses. Past tense, next one. Present tense, next one. Future tense. Today I run. Yesterday I Tomorrow I will run. In this particular case, which empire was ruling when John wrote down the book of Revelation? Rome. So I put a circle around Rome. And now we can read this verse intelligently. Let's read it. There are seven kings. Would you call them out, please? One, Chaldees. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. European community is the final world empire. They already have the common currency. It came in this year. It affects the lives of 300 million people. It is called the euro, and they have yielded up their national currencies that they might be bound together because it is money that holds people together. Now, watch this, everybody. Five are fallen. Past tense. He's looking back from this one. Let's go through. One, two. All together, folks. Come on. One, two. No, no, I'll say the, I'll say the numbers. You say the... <laughs> You're having me on, you feel? <laughs> this, is, this has got to be Australia. <laughs> Number one, Chaldees. Two, Egypt. Three, Babylon. Four, Medo-Persia. Five, Greece. Is he correct? Yes, so we give him a tick. When I said that in America, they all laughed. I said, what are you laughing at? They said, a cow has ticks. The Americans call that a check. A check for John. You get the idea? Then he says in the present tense, one is, that is Rome, is he correct? Yes. yes. And the other is not yet come. There's your European community. And when he comes, he must continue a short space. How long will the common market last? It started in power this year with their common currency. How long will it last? A short space. So I'll put that down here. Short space. 
And then we read the next verse about a great world leader who will arise. He's called Antichrist. And he's also called the beast. He's called the man of sin and the son of perdition, which name was previously applied to another man in Bible history whose name was Judas Iscariot. Let's read about him. Verse 11. And the beast that was, in other words, the devil that will inhabit this great world leader, was in Judas Iscariot and is not. In other words, in 96 AD, as John wrote all this down, he didn't know who he was. Even he is the eighth. There will be seven world empires, and then the eighth will be the leader. He is of the seven. In other words, he takes over the leadership of this seventh one, and he goeth into perdition. The same place that Judas Iscariot went is the same place this man will go. There's going to be a devilish man run the whole world shortly through the common market. He will sign a peace treaty in the Middle East, and he will be responsible with another man called the false prophet to bring in a new world money system called the mark of the beast. Would you write down the scriptures for all this, please? Leadership of the common market, Revelation 17, verses 10 to 12. Number two, the signing of the peace treaty between the Jews and the Arabs, Daniel chapter 9 and verse 27. Your scriptures for the mark of the beast, Revelation chapter 13, verses 16 to 18. And we've already spoken about the mark of the beast. It is a silicon chip, that's all. And did you know that people are now lining up for the chip? It's out this year. Have a look at this one. There are 5,000 people with their names on the list hoping to receive the mark of the beast. Already. Some of you haven't been in the meetings, but you need to know this. Look at it. People queue up for computer chip implants. The chipping ceremony will be held in the U.S. state of Florida and will be uh, performed by Applied Digital Solutions, the Florida technology company. The chips called VeriChip are rice grain sized devices that sit under the skin. When scanned by a special reader, the chip emits a radio signal that will transmit a code which is linked to secure databases. They're going to link them up to satellites shortly so they can trace these people around the world. That's, there's the beginnings of the mark of the beast. They will finally cancel cash. We've learned this already, as our poster says here. Here's an empty wallet upside down laughing. Let's read it together. Welcome to the cashless society. Over here, welcome to the cash society. Over here, welcome to the cashless society. And when the cash is cancelled, they are ready, they've started already through a group called Applied Digital Solutions to bring in the mark of the beast as spoken of in Revelation chapter 13, verses 16 to 18. Let's, let's listen to it. And he, referring to the Antichrist, causes all, both rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. And we know what the number is altogether, 666. And so we've dealt with all that. We haven't got time to do it again tonight. Let's read a bit more. That's verse um, 12. We notice in the Bible, there are, a lot, there are four lots of ten mentioned there, and all of these refer to the inner tier of the common market. Tony Blair is saying that they will have the, uh, 10 nations come together for full political and monetary union in the center, tier, T-I-E-R, and the outer tier probably will be made up of 18. We have 15 nations in the market already, 13 applying to join, that'll make 28, and the, eight, uh, the 18 on the outside tier will be controlled by the inner tier. The word of God calls them by four lots of 10, there are 10 horns in the book of Daniel, chapter 7, Ten crowns, ten kings, and ten toes on the image in Daniel chapter 2. That's the inner tier, and we're living in the days, and the good news is Jesus is coming. Amen. My job is almost finished, and I can stay home and cut the grass. I'm a dangerous man on a mower. Did you know that? I heard my son laughing the other day. I said, what are you laughing at? He was telling the, the visitors about my latest adventure. I have a lot of adventures, and I was on the ride on mower. We live on 25 acres. Uh, on the top of the South Island, and I was on this ride on mower, mowing near a swing, a kid's swing. I had it hanging, a rope hanging from a branch on a tree, and I was too lazy to get off and shift it. And the next minute, I found myself hanging. Up. It, it lifted the mower right off the ground, and I was swinging up the tr on, on the mower, still sitting on the seat. It happened very quickly. Life is very exciting. 
Let's read verse 12 together, all together. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. There's another piece of information. How long will the common market last? A short space. When they get their leader, how long will it last? One hour. Now, I thought about this for some time, you see, prophetically speaking. One day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. So I thought, how long's an hour? I got a big piece of paper, I did a giant sum, and I, and I got away out here somewhere and lost my place. So I said, Lord, give me the answer, please. I found it. Revelation 13 and verse 5 will tell you how long an hour is in the sight of God. How long will the Antichrist rule in power over this earth? Revelation 13, 5, read with me, please. And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. How long is forty-two months? Using a Jewish calendar of thirty days to a Jewish month, it is three and a half years. That is the exact length of the tribulation period there. Notice it's called forty-two months. One thousand two hundred and sixty days, working at thirty days to a Jewish month, is three and a half years. It's called by the mystical term time, one year singular, plus times, two years plural, plus half a time, which is six months. One and two make three and a half years as the full length of the tribulation period. And we Christians are not looking for that. We're looking for the coming of Jesus. Amen. Someone said to me, this mark of the beast thing. Um, oh, here it is. Pop it on. Did you put the mark of the beast on. There it is. They're putting it on animals already. Dogs, cats, fish, birds, and horses. There it is. Look, identity chip. Here's the injector they use. Lift the skin on the dog's neck, fire a little chip. It's only the size of a grain of rice, exactly as they said, and apply digital solutions that they're putting into humans. And then if you want to know who the animal is, you use this thing here. Scan it, you see? You go, scan. No offense to anybody in the front row. And we push the button, and the name of the animal is there. Rover. He's owned by Mr. and Mrs. Brown, 16 King Street, Penshurst. The phone number is there, and you can identify the animal. We have learnt already in our meeting, they have been talking for years about putting the chip into people, and they're starting this year. There's a family received it already, some of you know that. A father, a mother, a son and a daughter have all received it in America. This is big news all over the world. It's the beginnings of the mark of the beast. Cash is going to be cancelled. Anybody who loves money, forget it. Start to love Jesus. Now, some of you say, but I've got a lot of money in the bank. Well, you need to hear this. The economy of this world is buying and selling. The economy of heaven is giving and receiving. And in these last days, we're going to be looking after each other. We will fellowship much more as we see the day approaching. And if you've got potatoes and I haven't, and I've got cheese and you haven't, we'll swap. We'll be, we'll be trading one with another and looking after each other. And God will be providing miraculously. Amen. Some of you have heard my story. I've told the story hundreds of times. I'll tell it again. The Lord was good. We were living in Samoa years ago. And I asked the pastor to come home for, for dinner one day. And my wife said, we have no food. I said, don't worry. I've just read the book about a man called George Mueller. George Mueller from Bristol, England. In fact, I start in Bristol. But I'm going to Bristol in um, June the 1st. I'll be over there next month. And George Mueller's big buildings are there. They're giant orphanages. And this man fed his children by faith for 50 years. He said, in 50 years, my children have never gone without a meal. All he'd do was pray before. There's nothing on the table, just a salt and pepper shaker. And the old man would pray like this. Father, we thank you for this beautiful meal that we are about to enjoy. And all the kids are looking through their hands. <laughs> there's nothing there. And as soon as he finishes, listen, knock on the door. He sends someone to the door, and there's their morning breakfast. Fifty years, he said, God has never let my orphans go without a meal. So I said to my wife, don't worry, we're going to have the pastor and his wife for lunch, and they will all enjoy it together. So we all sat at the table. I said to him, some of you Psalm 1 folk remember who it was. It was Fatih Alofa, Pastor Fatih Alofa. So I said, um, brother, you give thanks for the lunch, would you? But before you do, there's something I must tell you. <laughs> I said, there's nothing to eat. But I've just read George Mueller's book, so give thanks. So he gave thanks, and, and while he was praying, I opened my eyes to have a look at him. And there was a little smile about his lips as he prayed. As soon as he said, Amen, listen. I, I said, just like the book. I jumped up, rushed to the door, 
And I'm telling you the truth tonight, I opened the door and there it was. All the food was sitting there, a giant box steaming hot with all the food we needed for our Sunday meal. It was so exciting. I never stopped for a moment. I'm, I'm a man of uh, pra practicality. I'm not a sort of a visionary. And I ran past that box. I went out the back. There was nobody there. I went to the side of the house. Nobody. I went over here. Nobody. I went out in the road. There's no dust. There's no car. There's nobody could have possibly got away in that time. And I am saying tonight, we have been fed by an angel. Amen. And some of you tonight, unbelievers, say, I don't believe that. Well, that doesn't bother me because you weren't there. I ate the food. <laughs> That's the God we serve, everybody. Amen. And so we notice that according to Revelation, chapter 17, back to Revelation 17, they're going to come together. Let's read verse 13. Your common market will come together. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. Now, I, I want this to go on tape tonight. The common market are looking for a leader right now. Write it down, please. They're looking for a president. And it could happen this year. They've had a, a council of ministers. That was a failure. They've had a European parliament. That was a failure. Now they want one man to run the whole show. Not a committee. I think it was years ago a man called Henri Spark, Secretary General of NATO, said these words in 1957. We are tired of committees. Send us a man, whether he be God or the devil, and we will receive him. They're going to get a man soon from the devil himself, and they'll receive him, all right. Now, some of you have sat on committees, and you will agree, it's better to have one man get the job done. One man described a committee as a group of people who individually could do nothing and collectively decide that nothing can be done. <laughs> <laughs> or a group of people who keep minutes and waste hours. We now move on. You say, what will cause, here's the question, what will cause the common market to come together and give their power to the leader? Let's read verse 17. Altogether, for God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. The common market will give allegiance to one man shortly who will be the president of the European community. You will never forget this meeting tonight. Now that being the case, you remember years ago, um, <clears throat> there was a great king called Nebuchadnezzar who was the king of this one, the third historical empire, but the first prophetic empire. Because this prophecy was given in the days of Babylon, in the book of Daniel chapter 2, do you remember? Daniel saw a great image. Remember that one? So we've got to start in, in Babylon this time because we're looking at the thing from a prophetic point of view. I don't want to confuse anybody, but if you can just get this clear tonight, please. So this now becomes number one. This one here becomes number two. Prophetically, this one here becomes number three prophetically. This one here becomes number four. So the first one prophetically is Babylon, the head of gold. Have a look, please. Daniel is called in by Nebuchadnezzar. He has the gift of the interpretation of dreams and visions. He says, you, O king, are the head of gold. That's Babylon. The next one is Persia, the chest and arms of silver, Medo-Persia. The next one is Greece, the great world empire of Greece, the loins of brass. The two legs of iron represent the two empires of eastern and western Rome. And then there is a gap, and then we have the common market down here, which is your final world empire. I remember saying that in Western Australia, I was preaching in a town called Katanning. Anybody heard of that one? And this old Aussie man called out, he said, oh, he says, there's no gap there. He said, I can't see any gap. He said, you preachers are all the same. When you get stuck, you put in a gap. <laughs> I said, I'm not stuck. He said, you can't show me a gap in the Bible. I said, yes, I can. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. Some of you probably know the verse, so say it with me, please. Here we go. For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. Stop. Now we put a gap in brackets. And 2,000 years later, now we carry on. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God the everlasting father, the prince of peace. There is a gap, a mystery gap of 2,000 years called the times of the Gentiles, where God moves away from Israel, puts temporary blindness on them, gives people like us an opportunity. Amen. Anybody who's a non-Jew here tonight, this is your opportunity. You better move fast. When I give the invitation tonight, if you are not born again into the family of God, Jesus said you must be born again. So at the end of this meeting, I give an invitation. And people get out of their seats. They come and stand in the front. 
and they have an experience of God. It's a mystical, wonderful experience when Jesus comes to live in our hearts. It's a covenant. When Jesus came to earth, he never came to set up a religion. He came to set up a relationship. And therefore, you'll never have that relationship until you covenant with him. So when you come to the front tonight, we will invite people at the end of this meeting to get out of their seats. You will stand in the front just here, and we will pray this prayer. Lord Jesus, I come to the front tonight as a sign I'm actually coming to the cross. I humble myself. I repent of my sin. I turn away from it. Number two, I believe the Bible is true when it says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness for sin. Your blood is enough to cleanse me, as you will see tonight in our meeting. And number three, I open the door to my life, and I receive Christ. The Bible promises clear, to as many as receive him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. How lovely to see people receiving Christ. Pastor Norm, you must have seen a few over the years. Pastor Ruth, anybody serving the Lord? We have other pastors here. Pastor Pasifika, God bless you. Any other? Pastor Tapa. Which other pastors have we got here tonight, please, from different churches? Just raise your hand for a minute. Let's know who's here. Well, all right. So all of you who, and others who are not pastors, you've been serving Christ. What a joy to win souls. Amen. He that winneth souls is? There's another scripture. Even if you're not soul winning, if you can help people on the Christian life. That's in Daniel chapter 12. It says, they that turn many to righteousness shall shine as the stars forever and ever. So even if you're just helping people who are saved to get a better Christian life, that's part of the thing you can do. It's exciting, isn't it? All right. So that's enough of that. I want you to notice too, if you read on in Revelation chapter 17 there, you'll read there about, let's go back, shall we, to verse 1. There came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials would talk with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the judgment of the great whore that sits upon many waters. The word whore, of course, we use the word prostitute these days. There are certain areas of the world where they live or they hang out and ply their trade. For example, if you go to London, you find them in Soho. If you go to Amsterdam, you cross the river. There's a whole street full of them there. If you go to Sydney, Australia, you find them where? King's Cross. If you go to New Zealand, you find them up Vivian Street, you know. There's, there's certain areas where they go. I remember years ago, we were traveling at the bottom of the Dead Sea in Israel. We do many trips down there. And we went, we passed Sodom and Gomorrah, the homosexual cities of the plain. They were blotted out by God. And as we stayed in the hotel, the hotel was called the Lot Hotel. <laughs> and on the wall it said that night they were going to do the Sodom Disco. My wife and I went for a walk outside. There were all these piles of salt from the Dead Sea, you see. And my wife said, I wonder which one is Lot's wife. <laughs> and I talked to the people on the bus on our tour. I said, do you realize that when God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, the homosexual cities of the plain, the, you can't kill a devil. They killed the homosexuals, but not the devils in them. They spread out all over the world. And they're around Oxford Street in Sydney. Is that correct? Yes. They're in San Francisco. The devils are still there. It doesn't matter what nationality. You look at the faces of the people who have got this problem. They're all the same. They talk the same. They look the same. It's a spirit. But Jesus can break that spirit. Amen. And so, we read there about this great prostitute system. It's a religious system. Verse 3. So he carried me away in the spirit to the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast, there's your antichrist, full of the names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. Now do we know what the seven heads are? Yes, we'd read verse 9, altogether, 17, 9. Here is a mind that hath wisdom. The seven heads are the seven mountains on which the woman sits. So we're looking for a, a, a place with seven mountains or seven hills. Verse 18. And the woman which thou sawest is the great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. So to find the religious capital of the end times, we're looking for a city with seven mountains or seven hills. So we go to Auckland, New Zealand, seven hills. Did you know that? Bonn, West Germany, seven hills. Tokyo, Japan, seven hills. Sydney, Australia, seven hills. <laughs> we were traveling on the train out in the suburbs, and my son said, look, Dad, we stopped at a station, seven hills. I said, I don't think that's the one. 
The one we're looking for, of course, is the city of Rome. Everybody knows that. Bible students over the years have known that for years, the city of Rome. And there we have a system which will head up the great world church, which is coming. Now, I want to show you something. We're going to go back just for a minute to uh, Revelation chapter 16, 19. Try and put this in perspective. This is a key verse. Many years ago, this great king, Nebuchadnezzar, ran the system of Babylon. It is now situated in Iraq. But we learned last night that in the latter days, Babylon will not be rebuilt in particular, although Saddam Hussein is trying to do it. But there is a new system coming out called Mystery Babylon. And Mystery Babylon is in three parts. Let's read it together, shall we? And the great city was divided into three parts. And the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. In the last days, mystery Babylon will make up the world system before it all moves across to Europe under the power of the Antichrist. And we are living since September the 11th at the end of that era where those three areas of the mystery Babylon are going to be judged by God. New York has had a little bit. Washington DC has had a little bit. But there's still another one. Rome has got to get theirs. And I want to show you these things as we move on tonight. Now, on the, on the back of every American dollar, <coughs> this is all old stuff. We've done this I don't know how many times, but for those of you who haven't been to the meeting, realize that there are two witchcraft seals there. Put it higher, please, sister, would you mind? Right up. So they can see. There it is there. Two seals. These are witchcraft seals. That is the eye of Satan on the back of every American dollar. There are 13 layers of stone standing for witchcraft and Freemasonry. And if anybody knows what a Freemasonry is, it is pure witchcraft. When they go in there, they put a black hood over their heads. They draw their thumb across their throat, like the ripping of the chest, the tearing of, sorry, cutting of the throat, ripping of the chest, and the cutting of the stomach, and kissing the Bible, sealing a witchcraft oath on the Word of God. So if you know any Freemasons, that's what they've done, you see. Then on the other side, you have over here so-called American Eagle, which is really a, a phoenix, a mystical bird that burns in the fire and rises out of the ashes in the last days. Now, this, these words up here, annua chapters, mean announcing the birth of Novus Ordo Seclorum, a secular, heathenistic, ungodly, new world government, new world religion, new world money system, new world law system. And, and, and Satan wants to be in charge of the whole world system and be the capstone of history. But we learned last night that Satan is not the capstone of history. Jesus is. Oh, I love that. I'm sick of people using his name as a swear word. Do you know I hear a lot of people on television these days, they're always saying, oh my God. Have you heard people say that? I didn't know there were so many Christians around. <laughs> it's incredible. You should have heard what the people said when the towers came down. I heard some of the stuff they said. That's about the first thing you'd hear. Oh my God. Who was their God? Satan, of course. So what they're really saying, oh my God, Satan. Until they receive Jesus, they'll never use that phrase again. Be careful, don't, use, don't say that. Anyway, over here you've got the so-called American eagle, which is really a phoenix. He's got a ribbon in his mouth, and on the ribbon are written three Latin words, er pluribus unum, which, which originally meant to take the 13 colonies of America and set up the United States. Now the idea is to privatize the world, which they're doing in Australia and New Zealand and around the world. Every country is losing their assets overseas, they're losing their power, losing their sovereignty, losing their independence, and we all become interdependent upon everybody else. Every country has one or two products for which they will be famous. Your country is wheat. Any Kiwis here tonight, your product is logs, pine logs. Italy, designer clothes. Germany, luxury cars. Uh, Switzerland, chocolates, watches, and stolen gold. <laughs> and so on. And so we have learned that this is the plan now, to set up a world government and a world religion. And already they have had meetings of the, of the ecumenical style meeting where these churches came together. The, uh, the Anglicans, Presbyterians, Methodists, uh, Congregational Associated Churches of Christ. Also present as observers, they have been Buddhists, Sikhs, Muslims, Hindus, the Church of Satan will not be exempt and the New Age movement will play a prominent part and it will be based in Rome the city of the seven hills. I want you to know that the prostitute goes with many men, but the bride is reserved for one man. 
And God, when you get born again, He will teach you. There is an event coming up called the Marriage Supper of the Lamb up there. Jesus will be the heavenly bridegroom. And everybody who has been born again and given their lives to Christ, their sins are, are washed away through the precious blood of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. They can get, become part of the bride of Christ. We go to the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's good news. But if we belong to this great religious mess where they're all joining together, that is called the prostitute system. God wants us to be the bride, not the prostitute. So be careful, please. Be careful where you go to church because the judgment they get in that church, you will get it also if you belong to it. Now, we've learned already that the whole the system is divided into three parts. And last night, we learned that New York was economy. Have a look at this, please. We learned that the whole city of New York, if you add together the numerics for New York, it comes to 666. A equals 6. Here's your key. A equals 6. B equals 12. C equals 18. D equals 24. Go right down to Z. Write yourself out a key and then look at New York. You'll see it also the home of Wall Street. The home of the world economy, which we learnt last night, is controlled from the city of London, which is called the Square Mile in the middle of London. They control the finance of America from there. That's why on the American notes it is written Federal Reserve Note. It should say United States Note, but in 1913, the Federal Reserve Act, the Europeans took it over and they control the finance from London, the Square Mile, the city of London. Uh, it is the home of the World Trade Center, the home of the United Nations, the entertainment center, and it comes to 666 for New York. Let's look at region number two. Washington, D.C. is the political center. It is the seat of government. There are 666 members in the American government, and it is the home of the Grand Lodge of Freemasonry. And the man who made the statement, Lucifer is God, was called Albert Pike, and he is buried in the walls of the Grand Lodge in Washington, D.C. What a demonic system. Lucifer is not God. Jesus is God. And we need to understand that Lucifer was created to, to provide music and worship in heaven. He got proud because of his beauty and his wisdom, and God threw him out of heaven. He used to be called Lucifer, but not now. He's called Satan, the God of this world, the prince of this world, and the prince of the power of the air. Remember that next time you fly in an aeroplane. I've got a lot of stories to tell about aeroplane flights. Now, the third region is Rome, religion, you see. Just for a moment, I'll just show you people who weren't here last night about the American government. Who would like to see that? 666 members. This is amazing. America was set up by the Freemasons for a peculiar purpose, and they saw to it there were 666 members in the government there. Number one, president, 14 cabinet members, 100 senators, 435 representatives, 9 Supreme Court Justices, 13 Appeals Court Justices, 90 District Court Chief Justices, 4 Territory Justices, 666 government seats in the American government. That cannot be by accident because the Freemasons have their symbols built into the streets of Washington, D.C. They set it up for a peculiar and a particular purpose. And I'm saying tonight in this meeting officially that the power of economy will move from this stage from America to Europe. And America will go down because as many men of God have seen and people of God, they have seen the judgment of God hit that country. Because they took the Bible away from schools, they got rid of prayer, they're worshipping heathen gods now. God is very angry and the judgment of God is on the three areas. Now we're going to look tonight at Rome. Please, would you put the other one on again please here, the third region? Now the third region is the home of the Vatican. It's a religious control and ultimately, the name of blasphemy is hidden in there. You're going to hear stuff tonight that will make some of you feel a little bit emotional. I'd appreciate it if you would not call out. I'm sick of people calling out and being rude. I've got no emotion. The stuff I'm getting tonight is giving you, I'm giving it to you because I love you. And I want the truth. I want us all in heaven. Everybody hear me, please. I don't like people that go around bashing churches. That's not my aim. My aim is to help people to get to heaven. And if you hear stuff that you've never heard before, don't be surprised because it took me a long time to put this together. I didn't read it in a book. I said, Lord, there's a mystery here somewhere. I've got to find out what it is. What is it really gets us to heaven? And some of the stuff you'll hear will make you want to shout. But please don't, friends. Be gracious. Just sit quietly. And if you feel someone next to you is going to shout, just put the hand on their shoulder. Settle down quietly. Just calm down, love. It'll be all right. Please do not storm out in anger. Do not storm out of the meeting. 
as I've had happen in various places. Can you imagine if you go to the doctor and he says, you've got cancer, and you say, how dare you? <laughs> that will not help the cancer, you'll agree? And the Bible says, he that answers a matter before he hears it, to him it shall be folly. Listen to the whole thing, and at the end, you'll realize that I have preached this message in Dublin, Ireland. Did you hear what I said? I have preached this message in Dublin, Ireland. Did the people love it? They loved it. They said, you are the first man who's ever given it clear to us, and we thank you for coming. They loved every minute, and they actually assisted me in putting all this together. So God bless. We're going to enjoy this tonight. Now turn with me quickly uh, to um, Genesis 22, please. Genesis 22, we read the story of a dear old man of God called Abraham. He had a son whose name was Isaac, remember? We're going to read about him. Let's read in verse 1. It came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, he said, Behold, here I am. Verse 2. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. And at the end of verse 6, I love it, I've underlined it actually, it says here, so they went both of them together. We have a word, when you're teaching prophecy, we find that the Jewish people use this. They say, when you're looking at things that will happen in the future, they have already happened in the past. The word they use is midrash. For example, in the Old Testament, the great king Nebuchadnezzar, he put a statue up, do you remember? He said, you bow down and worship the statue. Midrashically speaking, it'll happen again. In the days in which we live, this Antichrist man will put up a statue and demand that people worship it. In the Old Testament, there was a man who was sold by his brethren for numbers of pieces of silver. In the New Testament, there was another one who was sold by his brethren for 30 pieces of silver. His name is Jesus. The first one was Joseph, you see. This is Midrash. And what I'm saying tonight is that when Abraham and Isaac went both of them together to Mount Moriah for a sacrifice, many years later, there was Almighty God and His Son. They went to exactly the same spot. They went both of them together for a, to the place of sacrifice. And there Jesus died for us. Now I've got a son. His name is Andrew. I had three daughters. I've got two now. One's gone. Some of you know. My son Andrew uh, is my friend. He's a good boy. He's aged about 36, I think. Seeing my wife's not here, I can't guarantee it. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies remember these things, don't they? I always have to ask you. Don't you? Now, I delivered my son. Our children were born in very unusual circumstances. The first one, Becky, was born in a thatched house in the islands. I was cleaning up the school at the end of the year, cleaning up my classroom. I came along, an old Tongan lady was massaging my wife, and when I arrived there, the baby was there. My eyes popped out of my head, I tell you. I said, praise the Lord. Come on, love, let's go home. <laughs> so I picked her up, she picked the baby up. Home we went, we got an old washing basket, we made a cot for it. We got some rags, I made some nappies for her, and gave her a drink of warm water. She never looked back. And today my daughter Becky is on the do loss with her husband and four children going around the world serving God. That's good. About a year later, my wife's off at a prayer meeting. She runs in and says, help me, quick. There's another one coming, you see. So I ran off to get the old lady. I came back and she's lying there with a baby sitting on her stomach. She delivered the second one herself. Do you know my wife is so quick, she even made my tea for me on the, when the first one was born that first night. Got up and cooked my meal for me. Think of all the fuss you ladies go to. <laughs> we came back to New Zealand. I'd been gardening. I'd clay all over my hands. And we're visiting my sister <laughs> in Auckland. My wife said, quick. I said, never fear. Smith is here. <laughs> <laughs> and I delivered my own son. I held him up by the heels, smacked his bottom. I'd seen that on television. <laughs> And he cried, and I shouted, praise the Lord, it's a boy. <laughs> That's my son. I delivered him. There's a special bond between us, you know that? And then later, our daughter Debbie was born in the motor car on the way to hospital. I called her Chevy. <laughs> <laughs> You'll agree, we have a very unusual lifestyle. It's all different. Do you know that, can I can't imagine how, how Abraham felt with his son Isaac? 
They saddled up the horse and away they went, or the donkey, and up the valley they went. We live in a valley called the Polaris Valley. I say, come on, son, come on, Andy. We're going for a trip together, a bit of a picnic. Up the valley, <laughs> up the valley we go. We've saddled up the horse. We've got all the gear on the horse. When we get up the valley, right at the top, I say, alongside the beautiful Polaris River, where, where we are situated, I say, go down the riverbank, son, and get some stones and build an altar. He's a very obedient boy, because if you live with me, you have to be. <laughs> I'm an ex-school teacher who worked on the old system. You all know the old system? And I found things like this very useful. <laughs> Without saying it publicly, unless, unless we have someone here from the government <laughs> who will accuse me of violence. So my son goes and gets the rocks, he builds an altar. Then I say, come here son, I tie him up with a rope. And if he doesn't smell a rat at that point, he needs help. Come on son, lie on the altar. I can see my boy lying on the altar in type, you see. And then he asked a question. What does Isaac say to his dad? Let's read, shall we? Verse 7. Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father, and he said, Here I am, my son. He said, Behold the fire and the wood. Where's the lamb for the burnt offering? Now what sort of a question is that? To ask a loving father. Imagine my son says, Dad, got everything here, but there's going to be a sacrifice. Where's the sacrifice? What am I going to say? Am I going to say, Don't worry about this knife in my belt, son. <laughs> Everything's going to be all right. I can't say that. Poor Abraham walks away and he says, Lord, I don't know what to say. How can I answer the question? And the answer is given. He comes back again. He gets the wisdom from God. Verse 8. And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb. And that's the key to the Christian life. That is the key. But a lot of people don't know that, you see. And so you remember the story? He finds a ram in a bush. He takes the ram across. This teaches substitution. And he cuts the ram's throat and he unbinds his son. But in type, God says he received the son as being given as a sacrifice. But there was substitution there. Jesus was our substitute. You can get on a plane. We're in Sydney tonight, aren't we? That's right. You get on a plane down the airport here and you go a, a few hours up into the east. You stand alongside a river. You'll see a woman there pick up her firstborn son, lift it up, and there's a crocodile waiting with his mouth open. She throws it into the mouth of the crocodile. There's a snapping noise and a swirl of water and it disappears under the water. She turns away with a sob. And I say, what have you done that for? She says, I'm trying to get myself right to meet God. I'm going to die one day and this baby, the first from my womb, is a sacrifice to the God of the river. I must get to heaven. And she turns away with a cry and she walks down the street. And as she goes down the street, I say, hasn't anybody been to your village to tell you God has provided himself a lamb? I go up the road further, I see a man falling on his face. He's got blood all over his hands and legs and he's measuring his length. He gets up again, he falls again, he falls again and again. What are you doing, sir? He says, I am going on a holy journey to a holy place so that my soul will be saved because I want to finish up in the presence of God, the great, great spirit. And I say, hasn't anybody been to your village to tell you God has provided himself a lamb? He says, I know nothing about that, sir. Excuse me, I must continue on my way. And he falls again, and the blood spills. I come back to my country. I see a man, 5.30 in the morning, in a BMW. He pulls up at a church. He gets out. He goes into the church. He lights some candles. He puts some money in a plate. He says a few prayers. He comes out and gets into his car. And as he's driving off, I say, what are you doing? He says, I do this every morning of the week. My grandfather did it. My father did it, and I'm doing it, that I may gain merit with God. There are scales in heaven, and the more times I do this, the scales will go in my favor, and I will get myself saved. And I say, hasn't anybody told you, even you who live in Australia or New Zealand, God has provided for you a lamb? He said, I know nothing about that. My family have always done it this way. I must keep doing it. And there are some of you in this meeting tonight who have got the same problem, trying hard to get yourself right to be with God, but God has provided himself a lamb. And we're going to show it to you tonight. This is most exciting. Out of all the stuff I speak, I love this. Turn with me, please, to the prophecy in Isaiah chapter 7. Out of all those religions coming together, you say, will they ever hear? I trust they will. That God and his grace will give them an opportunity to hear something like this, and God will bless them. Let's read in Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14 a prophecy, please. All together, 
Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now I'm talking tonight about region number three. Region number three is the city of the seven hills will be the home of religion. Now listen, it won't be Protestant, it won't be Orthodox, it won't be Catholic, it won't be Eastern, it'll be a conglomeration where you can worship any God you want, just like Freemasonry. As long as you believe in a supreme being, you can be a Freemason, and that's what they're going to do. You see, a lot of people believe all roads lead to Rome. I've heard people say this. You ever heard this? Therefore, all religions lead to God. Not true, everybody. No religion leads to God. Jesus leads to God. He said, I am the way. Say it with me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Wonderful. That's clear. Anybody who's in heaven will be there because of Jesus. And I was preaching this at a farmer's meeting in New Zealand one night. I said, every man in his own way is trying to get to heaven, but God has ordained that there is only one way that men will ever get there, and that is through Jesus. And a man in the second row, I can still see him getting to his feet, and he shook his fist at me. I have people shouting at me all over the world. They get emotional. This fellow jumped up and he says, you call that love, do you? He said, this is in New Zealand, mind you. You call that love, and he shook his fist, and he stamped out of the room. As he went through the back door, I said, thank you for your contribution, good night. And as he went out, a lady said, you know who that was? There's a great buzz of conversation. All the farmers knew who he was. I said, who was that? She said, one of our local Christian ministers. She said, he's been to college, and he's learnt that all roads lead to Rome, therefore all religions lead to God. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible is the authority. Come on, everybody. Amen? Amen. It's the authority. And God says there's only one way, and that is Jesus. And she said, secondly, she's not only has he been to college and learned liberal theology, his brother is a Buddhist. I said, that makes sense. I'm trying to get his brother in the back door, you see. Now, so we see here in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, there's, that God's going to give us a sign or a wonder. What is the sign or wonder? A virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son. Has anybody got a Bible tonight without the word virgin there, please? Have a look at it. Isaiah 7, 14. Some of your, who's got an RSV, I think it is? It says young woman. Woman. Now, will you agree with me? It is not a great sign when a woman has a baby. They're having them all the time. But when a virgin has a baby, that is a sign. And there's got to be a reason for it. I'll show you. Okay, so now we turn, and we go now to the book of Luke, and I want you to go with me to Luke chapter 1, and we're going to see a fulfillment of this. This is where we will start learning stuff tonight, and I have no animosity, I'm not a, a church basher, I'm a preacher of the gospel, and I want to get as many to heaven as possible. And thirdly, listen, I have to answer to God for this meeting. Did you hear me? If I'm wrong, well, pity me, I must be careful. Let's read Luke chapter 1, shall we? And we're going to read in verse 26. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph. And we know who the virgin was. Her name was Mary. Mary. Now we're going to have a look and see a few things about Mary for a start. And we're going to dispel any uh, mishap, mis uh, teaching. Now, the first thing I learned about Mary is that she was a sinner like everybody else. The Bible teaches us that. And try and get this into our minds, friend. We must go to the authority on this. I preached this in Dublin one night, and I was so thrilled because the people received it well. And the, here's the proof. Let's read, shall we, Luke 1, 46 and 47. If you've got a pen, write it down. And when you get home, look at it, and you'll see it, you see. And Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord. And my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Saviour. So we find that Mary was a sinner. She actually said so herself. Who needs a Saviour? A sinner. And so she, what she was saying is the baby that was in her womb was the one that would save her with his precious blood. And when I preached this in Ireland one night, a dear lady came to see me afterwards. She said, I got a tremendous shock when I saw that. She said, Barry, I went home and I said, Lord... Can you please give me another scripture that will confirm that this is correct? And I'm going to give it to you. I'm so glad because I've never heard this before. Turn with me to Luke chapter 2, and we're going to read in verse 22. All together, please. 
And when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were accomplished, they brought him, Jesus, to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. Verse 23. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Not only did Mary confess that she had a saviour within her womb, but she offered a sin sacrifice as was required of every Jewish girl in those days. Now, you say, is that important? It is. But it is also imp important that we recognise that Mary was blessed. You know, you've heard of saying, blessed art thou amongst women? That is correct. Did you know that she was about the age of 14 when she had Jesus? She was that young. And she, she, she had the desire of every Jewish girl in her womb. The Messiah was actually formed in her womb by Almighty God. In the book of Hebrews we read, A body hast thou prepared me. God himself worked in the womb of this young girl and prepared the body of his son, Jesus, who was originally called the Word. But we read in John chapter 1, verse 14, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And so God put a body on his Word and called his name Jesus. Now before we go any further, let me clear this point up. I have heard some people say that Mary is the mother of God. Now that is not good teaching. The one that we worship is the Lord, Jesus, Christ. There are three parts there. The Lord is the God part. The Jesus is the man part that was born through the Virgin Mary. And the Christ is the anointed one, the Messiah. So Mary was the mother of this part here, the mother of Jesus, but never ever call Mary the mother of God because God was there before mothers were invented. Please see that, everybody. That's very important indeed. I want to say this to all of you Bible preachers. There was no Jesus in the Old Testament, although I've heard pr people preaching on it. The only ones in the Old Testament, there was the Lord God and there was the Christ, the Messiah. But at a certain time in history, the angel said, Thou shalt, future tense, call his name Jesus. At this point, the word becomes the flesh, and his name is called Jesus at that point, or Yeshua in the Hebrew. Now let's move quickly on. What else do we know? <clears throat> we learn <clears throat> that once Mary uh, got together with Joseph, they were engaged. Mary, we know that because the word espoused. Espoused or engaged. And in those days, the engagement was very similar to marriage, but there was no physical contact between the two at that time. They were very respectful one of the other. Now once Jesus was born of a virgin, she then got married to Joseph. Mary, I, never, I was never taught this. I've been to church most of my life and I never learned this. Mary married Joseph. And there will be people here tonight who are absolutely amazed as you read these scriptures because I've never heard anybody talk about it. So I thought if they don't do it, I'll talk about it myself. I want to show you something here. When she married jo Joseph, she had already given birth to Jesus. So we've got down here the birth. And you will agree that that was a mighty miracle? When Jesus, sorry, when Jesus was born of a virgin, that is a mighty miracle. Now why is that a mighty miracle? Why did God do that? I'll tell you why. Because the mother's blood never touches the baby. Everybody write that down please. Mother's blood never touches the baby. Had Mary's blood touched Jesus, there would have been a problem. His blood could not cleanse us because sinful blood would have infiltrated the, the Savior. But his blood was created by God and is called the precious blood of Christ. There is no link up there. Now watch this. I'm going to read to you a few things I've learned. The mother's blood does not pass, pass the placenta. Any medical person will tell you that, doctors, nurses, and so on in the meeting tonight. I had a midwife in the meeting the other night at Butterham. I was preaching up at... Uh, just by, where were we? Up in Queensland, Butterham, and the midwife in the back seat. I said, am I correct? Yes, you're correct. The chromosomes, the DNA, and genes from both the male and the female make up the child's characteristics. But a very special blood flowed in Jesus' veins. The genetic code for the blood is carried in the male sperm. I'll say that again. The genetic code is carried in the male sperm. In other words, when the Holy Ghost caused that sperm to come into Mary. It was the sperm of God himself created for a special purpose to create 
a saviour who can save us. There is only one person, therefore, who can give us full redemption from our sin, and that is Jesus Christ by his precious blood. Your blood cannot save me. My blood cannot save you. But the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses from all sin. Praise the Lord, everybody. You say, Whoa. Now you say, did they really get married? Is that in the Bible? Yes. Let's look for it, shall we? Ma Matthew chapter 1. <laughs> This is so exciting, everybody. Who likes all this? Oh, I like all this. Let's read Matthew chapter 1, verse 24. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife. Now we turn back chapter 1, verse 16. And Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who was called Christ. You say, they really got married? Yes. Real marriage? Yes. Now, what do you do after you get married? You go for a honeymoon, as a rule. <laughs> honeymoon. <laughs> I remember we had a guy, we were living on a farm in North Auckland. A fellow had been in prison his whole, whole life, never been out of prison. He came to visit us one day, and he was a friend of my son. His name was David. And this guy got out of the car, and there's a girl with him. And Andrew said, who's the girl? And he said, that's my wife. He said, I've just got married. Andrew said, I didn't know you had a girlfriend. He said, no, I just met her recently. He said, well, where are you going for your honeymoon? He said, what's that? Andrew said, you know, when you get married, you have a holiday together. Do you? He said, poor guy, never been out of prison. He didn't know anything. So he said, all right, I'll have it here, he said. <laughs> so he stayed with us. He and his wife had the honeymoon with us. Honestly, the most strange things happened to our family. <laughs> I had a friend who took a wedding. I had a friend who took a wedding for some folks who didn't know much about these things, and, and he was taking the wedding. He says, "We will now ask for the ring. Where's the ring?" And the bridegroom said, "What ring?" He said, "You know, you put a ring on the girl's finger. I don't know about that." He says, "So there's no ring. We will now go and sign the documents in the back room. Sister so and so will sing." They went out the back, and my friend who was taking the wedding said to the guy, "Where's your marriage certificate?" What certificate, he says. Oh, dear, he says. So my friend said they had to hang around in the back room for five minutes, pretending they were filling in the papers, but there was nothing to fill in. And they had to fix it up next week. And then he said he went away up north. He was in Kaitaia in North Auckland about a week later, and he met the girl, the bride. Hello, Millie, he said. What are you doing up here? She said, I'm on my honeymoon. And he said, well, where's your husband? She said, he couldn't get off work. <laughs> outrageous now the question is the question is does the Bible say that Mary and Joseph had a physical relationship yes it does turn with me to Matthew chapter 1 and we're going to read now in verse 25 here we go and knew her not the key word is till she had brought forth her firstborn son and he called his name Jesus that phrase, he knew her not, means he did not have a physical relationship with her until Jesus was born. Now, once that was out of the way, we now read in the New American Version, he kept her a virgin until she gave birth. The NIV says he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son. So the moment Jesus was born, they got married as the angel gave them the command from God. And then they went and had a physical relationship. And as a result of that relationship, six children were born. We're going to look in the Bible and find out more about this. Six children who were half brothers and sisters to our Lord Jesus Christ. Someone says, Goo, I never knew this before. Turn with me to Matthew 13, please. It's just so full of information. The Bible's great, everybody. If you just read the thing. The hardest job in the world is to get people to read it. They're so busy watching television, they never look at all this stuff. It's all there. Anybody can look this up. I did. Now listen, can someone tell me which town Jesus was born in? Bethlehem, where they've been having all this trouble in the church of the nativity. Been in there a few times. Where was he brought up? What town? Nazareth. Now, both of those are very dry, dusty little towns. Now when we go on our Middle East trip, we go to Nazareth with the tour. And the people in Nazareth in many shops know myself and my wife. 
So when we walk in after 18 times, they know who we are. We bring tour groups. So they say, hello, Mr. Smith. Hello, Mr. Smith. And I say, hello, so-and-so. I know who they are. I know some of the people there, good friends of mine, mostly Arab people in the town of Nazareth, lovely folk. I have cups of coffee with them, know them. How much more did the people know everybody when Jesus was there? Has anybody here ever lived in a small town? Does everybody know everybody? When Mr. Brown is bashing up Mrs. Brown, does everybody know? <coughs> when a fire engine goes down the road, does everybody know? Of course they do, they follow it. It's the most exciting thing ever happened in town, you see? Everybody knows everybody. So when Jesus turned up there with Mary and Joseph, let's read, shall we, what the people said. And I want you to help me at this point. You've got your Bibles there. Let's read. They said in verse 55, Matthew 13, 55, Is not this the carpenter's son? And is not his mother called Mary? And his brethren are called, call them out, please. James. Now give me a chance to write it down. James. Next one, please. Joseph. Next one, please. Simon. Next one, please. Judas. Yeah, now, you'll see there, there are four of them mentioned by name. Would you please notice that I've got there, there are six altogether at least. But then you read the next verse, it says, And his sisters, plural, are they not all with us? So we see that Jesus was not brought up an only child. He had at least six brothers and sisters, half-brothers and sisters, who were born naturally from Joseph and Mary later. Now, this being the case, you see, we can say that Mary was greatly blessed, but we can never again say that she is a virgin. Because once you've had a child, you cease to be a virgin. And once you've had seven, that's the end of it. <laughs> Hear what I'm saying? Now be kind, everybody. Listen. She is a very blessed woman. And when you get there, you can talk to her. And you can say, was Barry Smith right? She'll say, yes, he was. <laughs> Everything he said about me was true. The one that was in my womb was the one who saved me. I love him. His name is Jesus. He had very precious blood in his veins. Not my blood, but a special blood created by God. Listen, by the way, if the mother's blood and the baby's blood mingles, do you know what that's called? It's called RH factor. And there needs to be a blood transfusion at that point. Otherwise, something serious takes place. Jesus was not an RH factor baby. He was born of a natural birth, but God made a special blood. And when I talked to my children, I had four of them, I brought them up to say this, never talk about the blood of Christ, talk about the precious blood of Christ. For he is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. You say, well, have you got the names of any of his sisters? Yes. We're now going to turn to Mark chapter 15. Let's read verse 40, shall we? All together. There were also women looking on afar off. This is when he's on the cross, you see. Among whom was Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James. Come on. James the less is mentioned again. And, and, come on. And Joseph is mentioned again. And Salome. So Jesus' half-sister was called Salome. So when Mary called them for dinner at night, she would call out like this. Yeshua, she wouldn't call Jesus, his Hebrew name was Yeshua, which is very similar to Joshua, by the way. Yeshua, she would call out, James, Joseph, Simon, Judas, Salome, bring your young sister and come for dinner. <laughs> and so he was brought up in a large family. He knew what family life was. That's exciting. But they were half-brothers and sisters because the fathers were different. God was his father, but Joseph was the father of all these children here. Now, the next problem is this. I have to deal with every problem because I've got thinking people in the meeting. There are thinking people here tonight. And God's given us a brain to think. And when I was a young fellow, they taught me certain things in my church I found later were wrong. Listen to what I'm saying. I found that some stuff was wrong, and I had to, <laughs> I had to admit that. It's not easy. And some of you tonight will say, I've never heard this before. This is, this is amazing. You say, well, how do they get away with telling people all these things that she is still a virgin and things like that and so on? This is how they get away with it. They say that these are not real children. They say that these are an extended family. That's the argument they use. Now, let's think for a moment. When I go back to New Zealand, I can travel the country. I am Uncle Barry to masses of young people in that country. And my wife is Auntie May. They're not really, I'm not really their uncle. It's an extended family term. You get the idea? So then we have some Greek people in the meeting tonight. Where are the Greeks, please? 
God bless all the Greek folk. Oh, I only learned a few words. Tikkunas. <laughs> now have a look at this. I, 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 I learned this Greek word. I said, what is the word for brethren in the, in the Greek language? And they said, Adelphos. I'm not saying it very well, but I want to say it so the English folk will understand. Am I correct? Adelphos? Now, if you use the word Adelphos, that can mean uh, blood relatives or it can mean extended family. But in this particular case, I checked on the Greek and it doesn't say Adelphos, it says Delphus. And there is a difference. You Greek folk will know this. It means from the womb. The same womb that brought forth Jesus is the same womb that brought forth these other children. And thus we see Jesus came from a very large family. And I'm excited about this, but his precious blood is the only way that we'll ever get our sin forgiven. Woo. Got to cover every base. Have you got a lot of people going to attack you afterwards otherwise? Now let's turn, shall we, to Mark 16 and verse 1. You'll see another reference to the other children here. Let's turn Mark 16, 1. And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of, come on, James, here it is again, and Salome is mentioned this time. So you can see there are references throughout the Bible to the other children as well. They brought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. Okay. Now, we've gone through all that. I want to now move to another point. Did you know that Jesus never, ever called Mary mother? You say, what? We're going to check out a few places. I had to study this myself. Turn with me to Luke chapter 2, please. In Luke chapter 2, we're going to read there in verse 42. Do you remember when he went missing? When he was a boy, how old was he? He was 12. How many days was he missing? I want to say something. I'm a father. We live next to a river in New Zealand, a big river. If any of our grandchildren go missing, my wife and I almost have a heart attack. Because when there's water around, sea or rivers, you feel terrible. All you can see in your mind is one, a little one floating down the river face down, and you're terrified. And when one of our kids goes missing, I tell you, my wife runs and almost kills her. She has to run down a long way down to the river there. She searches the river bank and then finds them jumping on the trampoline somewhere. <laughs> this boy was away for three days. And after he comes back again, they confront him. Let's read it, shall we? Verse 48. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. Now what should he have said? If he was a good boy, he should have said, I'm dreadfully sorry, mother. I'll never do that again. I'm so I should have told you I was going away to have a chat with the people in the temple, but I'm sorry. Please forgive me. He didn't say that. Let's see what he said. Verse 49, And he said unto them, How is it that you sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? And I thought, put that in modern English. If my son went missing for three days, and he turns up and I say, Where have you been? And he says, Why did you bother looking for me? My son would receive something he'd never forget. <laughs> Who agrees with that? I'd be so overwrought with worry, I'd give him something, I'm telling you. But they humbled themselves because they knew that he was telling the truth. But his answer to me, I've written in here, a little bit rude. <laughs> now we'll now move to the second illustration. I'm illustrating the fact that he never called Mary mother. Would you turn with me to John 2? If you come to the Middle East with us, we'll take you to, to uh, Nazareth. We'll then take you to Cana of Galilee. Do you remember they ran out of wine at the wedding? And we're going to see what happens here. Let's read in John chapter 2. And the third day there was a, a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there, says John the commentator. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said unto him, They have no wine. Now, let, now what should Jesus have said? Jesus should have said this. Uh, mother, <laughs> uh, don't worry about a thing. I have power from God and I can feel a miracle coming on. <laughs> but he didn't say that. Let's see what he said. Let's read in verse uh, chapter 2 and verse 
For Jesus said unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. And you know what I wrote there in my Bible? A little bit rude. I think you can get the point, everybody. What's he really doing? He is showing that she had a part to play. And once her part was played, she was still blessed. But she will be in heaven by the blood of Christ only, like everybody else. And men have fiddled with the doctrine and made their own doctrines up, which are contrary to the word of God, you see. And so we read on the next illustration. The next one is found in Matthew 12. They're having a meeting, like we're having tonight. I love this, it's so nice. Matthew chapter 12. Let's read verse 46. Jesus is preaching just like I'm doing tonight. And while he yet talked to the people, behold, his mother and his brethren stood without, desiring to speak to him. And one said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren stand outside or without, desiring to speak with them. Now what should he have done? Oh, excuse me, everybody. My mother is alive. I've got a, my mother's alive. She's 95. She's almost gone. She's just right near the end. She said to me the other day, I, I want to go, son, but I'm still here. She's just had enough. When I talked to her on the phone, I, could, I talked to her this morning, I can only talk for a short time. Her voice goes, she's got one lung gone. She's got half a lung she's working on. She starts coughing. And I said, that's enough, mum. That's enough. I told her some time ago, I says, try and hang on. Make the rapture. But I, I've said, it's all right, mum. It's all right. She's had enough. Do you know my mother prayed for me when I was a little boy? I had an operation when I was eight days old. They took my stomach out and put a bypass in my stomach. And my dear mum, she said to me, son, she said, I, I, you, my dad, my, uh, my husband, Ted Smith, and myself, we prayed for you. And the church all prayed that you would live. And they said, if you live, we will give you to God to serve Jesus. And I knelt at my mum's feet. Just, just the other day, and I, just said, I said, well, mum, I held her hand. I said, you've done your job well. You've helped me. You helped me come to the Lord. My dad helped me receive Jesus. And I said, you've brought me up in the ways of God. I honor you for that. And I love my mum very much. But she's going to be with Jesus soon. And if I heard that my mother was outside this meeting tonight with my two sisters, I would stop the meeting. I would. I'd honor her. And I'd say, Pastor Norm, would you mind just leading a song or two? Pastor Ruth, if you just lead a song. I want to see my mum. But what did Jesus do? He's got them waiting outside. Let's see what he did. Verse 48, but he answered and said unto him that told him, who is my mother and who are my brethren? And then he stretched forth his hand toward the disciples and said, behold my mother and my brethren, for whosoever shall do the will of my father which is in heaven, the same as my brother and sister and mother. And I've written here a little bit rude. <laughs> <coughs> I want you to turn with me now, please, to the, when he's on the cross, John 19. Read, please, with me. We're reading in John 19. Let's read together, shall we? This is amazing, this bit. Now, there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother, says John, the man who wrote it down, and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene, when Jesus therefore saw his mother whom, and the disciples standing by whom he loved, that's John, the beloved disciple, notice what he said. He said to his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Now listen to the way he changes now. Then he said to the disciple, Behold thy mother. So when he talks to Mary, he calls her woman, but when he talks to John, he says, That's your mother. You take her as your mother. That's the only time he ever uses the word mother when he gives her away to a normal human being who was born of flesh and blood. And we see tonight that he is deliberately uh, uh, distancing himself from anybody else who could take the glory. There is no glory to anybody but Jesus, the Lamb of God and his precious blood. You're allowed to clap, everybody. Now, tonight I want to go further. I'm going all right. Am I going all right? Yes. <laughs> I do my best. <laughs> okay. Now, have you noticed that as you travel around, you'll see this? This is where some of you will get a shock tonight, I think. I got a shock when I learnt this. 
If you notice that you go around different churches, they've got different ways of worshipping and so on, you'll see that some churches have a cross with nothing on them, empty, and then others have a cross with a body hanging on, you see? Now the question is, <laughs> excuse me, listen, the question is, why is this one empty? And don't answer the question until we know the answer, please. And why has this one got a body hanging on it? Now, I could never work that out because you know you're an intelligent person. God has given us a mind to think. And I want to know which ones use the body on the cross. I travel through Europe and I see the Orthodox people believe in that. You'll find the Greeks, the uh, Yugoslavs, the Russian Orthodox, all these people, they have a body hanging on the cross. The Roman Catholic folk believe in a body hanging on the cross. I passed a Lutheran church in Horsham, Victoria. And as I passed the Lutheran church, I said to my wife, look at this, there's a body hanging on the cross there. What does it mean? Because I didn't know, and neither do, very, neither do many other people. So I said, Lord, would you please help me to find out the answer? And I found it, and I've got it written in my book, Second Warning here, and it will tell you what it really means. Now, the people are not told this. This is why I've got to teach the people these things. In my book here, I've got a statement by a man who is in a very strong position. His name is Archbishop Whelan. This is from my book, Second Warning, page 114, and I'm going to read to you what he says. It will explain why some people still have a body hanging on the cross and others don't. Here we go. He says this. I'll humble myself and put my glasses on. <laughs> His name is Reverend John Whelan, Archbishop of Hartford. You know Hartford, brother? Where is that? South of England, okay. This is what he says. Sacrifice is the essence of religion. It is only through sacrifice the union with the Creator can be perfectly acquired. It is only through the perpetuation of that sacrifice the union may be maintained. What makes the Mass the most exalted of all sacrifices is the nature of the victim, Christ himself. For the Mass is the continuation of Christ's sacrifice. He was the victim and the object of the sacrifice, and therefore the Mass is the same as the sacrifice of the cross. No matter how many times it is offered or how many places at one time, it is the same sacrifice of Christ. Christ is forever offering himself in the Mass. Now, I used to be a school teacher, friends, and um, when I was a teacher, I knew my English grammar, although I don't speak very well. I'm a bit rough. In fact, when I was in England, I was telling my brother here that uh, Colin... I heard someone talking about me, two Englishmen talking about me. And, and I heard one say, what's he like? They were speaking real flash English. Huh? What's he like? And the other one said, he's like a preaching crocodile Dundee. <laughs> <laughs> now listen to this. Listen to this. In this particular case, this is called, these people believe in a present continuous tense. It, it's became very clear once I saw that. These people believe in a past perfect tense. And you know when you went to school, they taught you, if you want to make something continuous, you add ing to the end. Is that right? Like flying, hopping, jumping, you know, running. In this particular case, they say Christ is still dying. Over here, they say past perfect tense, he has died. And that's what we've got to decide tonight, which one we feel is correct, because our whole, whole future depends on this. If Christ is still dying on the cross, the job has not been done properly. But if he has done it once and for all, then he's done the job, and we can get to heaven through the precious blood of Christ. Yeah. Let me tell you a story. You say, good, we need a story. Anybody from New Zealand here tonight heard of a town called Tokoroa? It's the timber town. We went to Tokoroa one time. We were having meetings in a public hall. And when we finished the meeting, I spoke on this subject. And afterwards, a big bunch of people came to see me because they were quite happy with what I said. It was, they were shocked, but happy. They said, we cannot argue with what you said. We understand now it's quite scriptural, but we are really a bit upset in this way that we attend a church where they have a, that on the front lawn of the church. What are we going to do? I said, well, this is what you do. Because God has given you a brain, and he's given me a brain, we are allowed to use the brain God's given us. Now, what I want you to do is go as a group. Don't go by yourself. 
I want you to go and see the head of your church or the leaders, arrange a meeting with them and have a chat. Don't get excited, forget emotion, just use your head and talk gently to them and ask them if I'm telling you the truth. That's all they've got to do. And then my wife and I left town. <laughs> you ever heard the phrase? He that fires his pop gun and runs away lives to fire his pop gun another day. We weren't running away. We used to preach seven nights of the week, sorry, six nights a week and travel on the seventh. So we had to move to the next town. And you know, one year later, oh, hang on, I better tell the rest of the story. Before that happened, um, the end of the meeting, when I spoke on this subject, these people said to me, would you give us another meeting, please? They said, this is so important to us, we want some more proof. I said, okay, get your chairs. They had had two hours of it and they wanted some more. Can you imagine such a thing? So they got their chairs, they put them in half a circle. I said, now let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Hebrews. And if you have a pen tonight, and some of you need to get a Bible for a start, I think. <laughs> Before you invest in a pen, I suggest you get a Bible. <laughs> and my father taught me, always carry a pen with you because you might hear something that you've never heard before and you might never hear it again. And so I carry two pens with me. Let me show you. Here they are. I carry a silver one. I bought that in Belfast, England, uh, Belfast, Ireland, and this one, a green one, for underlining things. And not only that, I carry a ruler. What? School teacher, yeah, that's it, yeah. Got me a ruler. Someone gave me a ruler the other night because I've lost the other ones. Remember I said I bought one in Australia a few years ago, I got ripped off? Five dollars for a thing like that, honestly. I've been ripped off in every country in the world, I think. So I said, get your pens out. So all this group, they sat in half a circle. Get your pens out. And every time I say the word once, underline it in your Bible. If you've got your own Bible, underline it. And I say the same to all of you tonight. When the Bible says once or once for all or sat down or anything like that, underline it. <clears throat> now in my Bible, not only have I put a circle around it, I've colored it. Let's read this, shall we? who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins, that's Jesus, and then for the people's, for this he did once when he offered up himself. Put a circle around that, please. Chapter, that's, oh, sorry, Hebrews 7, verse 27. Now, if you've got someone else's Bible, do not underline it. <laughs> We're now reading in the book of Hebrews, chapter 9, verse 12. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood. He entered in, listen, once, put a circle around it please, into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Put a circle around that. You say, where do we go now? Chapter 9, and we're going to read verse 26. Get ready with your pens please. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world, but now once. Circle that. In the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Verse 28, chapter 9, 28. Altogether, so Christ was once offered, put a circle, to bear the sins of many. Unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. We now turn to chapter 10. I've got all these people in half a circle. They're all busily underlining their Bibles. They're all excited. They've just learned something they've never heard before. Let's read verse 10, chapter 10, verse 10. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Underline that please. Now we turn to verse 12. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice, underline that. Next one, for sins. Forever. Underline that please. Next one, sat down. Underline that. Verse 14, for by one offering, underline that, he has perfected forever, underline that, them that are sanctified. I said, that's all. I've got nothing much else to say. You know what to do. Go and ask the heads of your church if that's what they're teaching, the other thing there. And we left. Do you know we went back a year later and I said to May, I'm a bit hungry. Let's stop here and get some food. So when you travel around, you just eat anywhere, you know. So we stopped on the side of the road, went and getting ready to go into a shop. A lady came down the road. She said, you Barry Smith? I said, yes. She said, I was in your meeting last year. God bless. I shook hands. I said, I remember you. Were you among that group who stayed after the meet? She said, yes, I was one of those. I said, what happened after we left? Oh, she said, that was interesting. <laughs> I said, I can imagine. 
I said, what did you do? She said, we made an arrangement with the heads of the church. We went down the next day and there's quite a few of them. They sat on that side of the hall and we sat on this side of the hall. And we sort of dialogued across the building. And you had told us, don't go by yourself because these men are so clever, they will twist their words to make it say something else. Make sure you've got a whole group there to force them to answer the questions. So this guy, one of our men stood up and he said, um, we have just heard that because this church still has a body hanging on the cross, you believe that it is a present continuous tense that Christ is still dying. Is that correct? And the leader of the church stood up. His veins were standing out in his neck. He went purple. And he said, who told you that? And another man stood up over here. He said, Barry Smith was here last night. <laughs> and this guy said, Barry Smith is an antichrist. And this guy over here said, we're not talking about Barry Smith. We're talking about this. <laughs> is it correct what we're saying? Do you believe in a continuous sacrifice or is it done once and for all? And the fellow was so angry, he started shouting. And the others got up, they were shouting at one another. She said, Mr. Smith, she said it was so disappointing. We found out then that they couldn't answer because one of our men said, if you can't keep a civil tongue in your head and answer a simple question, then we will have to leave, I'm sorry. And he said, we all got up and we walked out weeping as we went. And I'll tell you why they went, I can identify with this. Because when you have to leave something that you find is an error, it makes you weep. Because your father was there, your grandfather was there, your friends are there, your family is there, and I've had the experience. And when she said we walked out, nobody could speak. We were all choked up. And as we walked out of the building, we didn't feel happy about it. We felt absolutely dreadful. Nobody spoke to anybody. We just filed down the street, absolutely broken hearted. And as we got down the street, we saw a little church on the side of the road that believed that Jesus had done the job once and for all. She said, we walked in there, we were made welcome, and we give thanks to God. We listen to what you said. Because we want to get to heaven, and there's only one way to get there, and that is through the precious blood of Jesus. Amen. Praise God, everybody. There was a man who bought his wife a table, an oak table. It was lovely, and he came inside one night. She was planing the top with a plane from his shed. And he said, what are you doing? He said, she said, I thought I saw a bump on the table and I just went out your shed, I took the plane and I was just finishing it off. He said, that table was finished and anything you do to it will ruin the finished job. Anything you do to try and add to what Jesus has done will waste your time because he's done it once and for all. That's why he said on the cross, it is finished. He didn't say it is half finished. He said, it is finished. And unlike all the priests in the Old Testament who had to keep standing, offering the same sacrifices time after time. He sat down at the right hand of God and every time you go to one of those meetings, a mass or something like that, you make him stand up again and re-crucify him. Don't do it. In the name of Jesus, I beg you today, don't do it. Leave him sitting down. Rejoice in his salvation. His blood is enough to get you to heaven and say, thank you, Lord Jesus. For by grace are we saved through faith and that not of ourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. I'm almost finished. I want to finish on this tonight. You say, when will we see Jesus? Turn with me to Revelation 5. We close on this. Oh, now, I hope I didn't offend anybody, everybody. I'm not here to offend. You'll only see me once I'll be gone. Someone says, thank goodness for that. We'll never have a meeting like this again. Never. There will never be a meeting like this. And God's brought you here for a purpose to hear this. I know it's a shock. It's a terrible shock. But when you hear it, you say, thank you. It's all there, scriptural. Get the tape. Go through it carefully. And I've had people in New Zealand who have listened to this tape of this message and they've shouted and screamed. And someone's, excuse me, stop shouting and screaming. Get a Bible. And let's stop the tape every time we get a verse and look at it. And they said, it's here. It's here. It's here. But no one ever told them it was there. That's my job, to tell people. Not to hurt people, but to help you to understand the way to heaven, salvation, through the blood of Jesus. Let's read, shall we, references. Jesus is called the Lamb of God. So when he hung on the cross, his blood was shed. Jesus, called, Jesus was called the Lamb. Let's read in verse 6, Revelation 5, 6. In the midst, sorry, and behold, I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, the four beasts in the midst of the elder stood a lamb as it had been slain. Verse 8. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb. 
Verse 9, And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book, to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain, and redeemed us to God by thy blood, out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. I love that. Look at all the people in here tonight from many different nations. It's not only for Aussies, folks. It's for everybody. And then it says in verse 12, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb. And at the end of verse 13, and unto the Lamb forever and ever. Watch this, everybody. Shut. It'll give you hope. Now listen to the story. Some years ago, we were preaching in Ghana, West Africa. I went to preach in this big church that was run by a man called Bishop Duncan Williams. It was in the jungle, actually, this great concrete building, much bigger than this. There was about 3,000 people in the first meeting. And he said, you preach from up there. I got up on the platform, I started to preach. And as I started to preach to these African people, there was a big kerfuffle over here. I said, what's happening? They said, a cobra has come into the meeting. And there's people running in all directions, you can imagine. You know, one of those ones that goes like this. <laughs> and I said to my wife, what's happened? She said, there's a, a cobra loose over there. There's people running, I tell you what. Someone ran around, got a piece of four by two and knocked it on the head and killed it. And we got on with the message, but a man ran up to me after the meeting. He said, he said, that was satanic. He said, we have voodoo here. And he said, I was praying for you for the last week. And he said, the devil spoke to me and said, I will do something to disrupt this meeting by killing somebody in your meeting. But by the grace of God, nobody was killed and they managed to kill the snake before. The next night I came down, I got up on the platform, I preached for five minutes, the lights went off. The power cut off. That was voodoo, did it? The lights in town were on, Accra, which is the capital of Ghana, but all our lights were off. They checked the switchboard, nothing there, and the, the bishop stood up and he spoke. You couldn't see anybody. They're Africans. <laughs> you understand that? Not a sign of anybody, you know? This, and, this, and the bishop said, listen what the bishop said. He says, don't fear anybody. Don't fear, he said, I knew the devil was going to do this. I came to pray this morning and I met him standing by the altar here and the devil spoke to me. He was looking like a man. He was dressed like a man. And he said, I will put a stop to this man's meetings. You will not have it here. I'll stop it. He said, I was ready for him. I've got the generator. Pull this cord. And they pulled the cord and the power came on. And all the people got up and praised God. I preached. And people received Jesus. The next night I came down, I brought a torch with me this time. <laughs> Because if I stepped off the front, I'll kill myself. It's so high. It's a great big high platform. And I got five minutes into my message, the power went off again. Satanic stuff, I tell you. And all these people, were, you couldn't see a sign of anybody. The pastor stood up and said, don't fear. He said, I've got six generators here tonight. Pull the cords. They pulled the cords and nothing happened. They couldn't start any of them. And do you know, when we left that building that night, all the power came on and all the generators started as soon as we left. But while we were there, nothing would go. He said, okay, let's get up and praise God. So all the people got up and we worshipped the Lord. And as we praised God, the lights started to flicker on. And they were going full bore. When we were praising full bore, the lights were on full bore. And when we stopped praising, the lights went down again and went off. Get up and praise again. The lights flickered on again. You're dealing with spiritual stuff here, everybody. We're dealing with Jesus, the King of kings, Lord of lords. And the lights come on. We're worshipping him, you see. And when they stopped praising, down they went. He said, we can't keep doing this all night. You can't preach a message in the middle of praise and worship, you can see that. So he said, everybody go home fast and pray, we'll come again tomorrow night. The next night we came up again, I'm up on the platform, five minutes into my message, the power went off. The bishop stood up, he said, that's enough of that, put your car lights on, all the car lights came on, there's about 4,000 people in the meeting, pick your chairs up, they're all plastic chairs, put them on the roof of your car and follow me. And he drove off in his car, we're all hanging on to chairs on top of our cars. <laughs> And we drove into town to the capital city, Accra, and preached, and people gave their lives to Jesus. And when I say gave their lives to Jesus, when you do that tonight, you'll be born again by the power of God. I carry bundles of these. When I come to Australia, I carry that many. When I go to Africa, I carry that many. Because people come by the thousand to receive Christ. Now, hear what I'm saying tonight. <clears throat> the next day, they said, you're going to preach to 35,000 people. So they had four, three different tribes we had three lots of interpreters interpreting what I'm saying. It was done outside. They had pipe frames and canvas to keep the people out of the sun. And I got up to speak to these 35,000 people. Let me tell you, they danced for two hours before the meetings. I've got a video of my wife dancing with all the ladies. You know, when I come to these meetings in my country and in New Zealand, the people look at their watches. 
you know, because we have laws and things like that. In Africa, there's no laws. And they danced for two hours for a start. Ladies fell in the dust and worshipped Jesus with their nice clothes on. And I said, I've never seen this before. And then, and then I saw people dancing to the front. During the meeting, they had a 44-gallon drum for the offering. And if you were excited about the message, you danced to the front and threw your money in the 44-gallon drum. There's an idea, brother. <laughs> Good one. And I was preaching away there and the people were shouting, Hallelujah, they're all alive, you see. Listen, there's no television there. They're all excited. The meeting was the biggest thing on the agenda. And they were shouting, Praise God, Hallelujah, and everybody's enjoying it, 35,000. And in the middle of the meeting, an old lady came up and I was just standing here and she went, Bang, hit me like a rugby player and knocked me flying over here. I said to a man nearby, What's happened? Am I finished? He says, no, she's going to sing a song to Jesus. She's so excited, she's going to sing to Jesus. She took the microphone and she started to sing. And I want to tell you, she had a shocking voice. <laughs> it was awful. Ah, but when 35,000 people joined in, it was like being in heaven. She just started them off. And when 35,000 sang, I, just, I thought I was in heaven. And when they finished, I said, I said, when we get to heaven, kindred, tongues, tribes and nations will be there and you guys are going to lead the music. Amen. They will lead the play, praise and worship. They're alive. And I'm so excited to tell you that story tonight. Nobody has ever knocked me off the platform in Australia <laughs> with excitement. But when you get excited about Jesus and when you see that this is the only thing worth living for, you'll understand. It's been a good life. I've enjoyed preaching the Word of God, but the biggest joy I get is seeing people give their life to Jesus. I better tell you this, one night I preached in um, East London. That's it. Uh, uh, my, the boat is there now with my daughter on it, actually, the, the Doulos. It's in East London on the coast of Afri South Africa. And I used the verse from Revelation 3.16. Some of you know it. Jesus said, I wish you were hot or cold, but because you're lukewarm, I'll spew you out of my mouth. And I said, Lord, help me to preach that in a nice way. God's sick of people being lukewarm. A young couple in the meeting that night should have come to receive Christ. They didn't do it. They drove home 100 miles to the farm. And when they got home, he, he said to her, I should have gone forward tonight to receive Jesus, you know. And she said, I should have too. Why didn't you? I was waiting for you. Why didn't you? I was waiting for you. I want to say to all of you tonight, don't wait for anybody. Don't wait for your husband, your wife, or anybody. Get in yourself and then pray the others in. Because I'm going to give the invitation shortly. And then she said, I'm going to have a bath. Make me a hot drink, would you please? So he, she jumps in the bath and he boiled the jug. He made a cup of tea for himself, a hot chocolate for her. He used the same jug, same water. And he, she gave it to her, he gave it to her in the bath and she screamed and said, what a dirty trick. What's wrong? She said, it's freezing cold. You got this out of the refrigerator, didn't you? He said, I did not. I used the same jug to, as I used to make my cup of tea. Feel this, it was boiling hot. And she screamed. And they said, God is speaking to us, obviously. Same jug, cold water and hot water out of the same jug. The next day, they got in the car at five o'clock. They worked quietly on the farm all day. They drove back to East London. And when I gave the invitation at the end of the meeting, guess who was first out the front? That young couple ran to the front. I can still remember seeing them coming hand in hand. They were here and they gave their life to Jesus. Someone says, do I have to come to the front? Of course, of course you do. Where did you get married? Up the back or up the front? It's fairly clear. <laughs> so Jesus said in Matthew 10, 32, listen, Matthew 10, 32, whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, in front of people, him also will I confess before my Father which is in heaven. But whoever shall deny me before me, to stay where you are, him also will I deny before my Father which is in heaven. Simple English. Stand up for Jesus now, and then he will stand for you when you need a lawyer, most of all, at the judgment of God. It's a wonderful thing to receive Christ. Listen, everybody, I'm not saying to you, get out of this church and that church. I'm saying, receive Christ, and then let God do his work in your heart. He'll tell you what to do. I'm not telling you, but I'm asking you to be born again tonight and receive Christ. Just pray, Father, as the musicians come, Father, in the name of Jesus, touch men and women in their hearts, I pray. Let them see the value of the precious blood of the Lamb 
special blood and let them be saved properly tonight in Jesus' name. Be born again through the blood of Christ. Amen. We're going to sing our song, Amazing Grace. Do not leave the meeting at this point, everybody, please. This is the point of salvation. The devil would love you to walk out and take a hundred others with you. Just be very patient and wait. Those of you in the overflow, I want you to come in tonight, please. And as we preach this word, you come in here, down the front. We will help you to receive Christ also. God bless. Let's stand and sing it, shall we? Amazing grace as you make your way to Christ tonight. For a second group, those who have received the Lord in a back room or a pastor's office or a quiet place, you've never stood, you come tonight and confess it before men and you'll have a lawyer at the judgment, I promise you. Some of you say, I can't get out. Yes, you can. People will move as you make your way to Jesus. If you're a bit nervous, turn to the person next to you and say, please come with me and somebody will come with you. We're here to help you, not make it hard for you. There are others coming now. God bless you as you make your way to the Lord tonight. Would you come well forward, please, and make room for those who are coming. We're going to sing now the next verse, and the Lord bless you tonight. Let's sing it. I'm calling tonight for those who are away from God. You used to walk with Jesus, but gradually you moved away and you've now become what is called a backslider. I want you to get back under the blood of Jesus again. Amen. You come back under the precious blood of Christ and he will have mercy upon you and take you back into the family. Come home. There used to be an old song, I wandered far away from God, but now I'm coming home. Amen. You come home tonight and God will bless you as we sing this song, the last verse. As long as I see people keep coming, we'll keep singing. But when they stop coming, we'll stop singing, for it is a privilege to receive Jesus. Could we move forward a little, make room for those who want to come, please? Ready? We're going to sing the last one. When we...
Is there anybody else coming? Would you wave your hand to me, please? I'll wait for anybody who's coming. I must do my job properly, you see. There's people coming up here. God bless. I have to wait because I, because when I stand before God, I answer for every meeting. It's quite frightening, actually. I just pray he'll have mercy on me for the times I chopped it off too short. I don't want to go too long either to, to uh, embarrass the name of the Lord. He's a good Lord. Anybody else needs to come? Congregation, be seated. We'll pray with those who are here. Those of you in the back room, watch carefully, please. In the counseling room or the uh, overflow, I want you just to bow your heads with me, everybody, as we pray the sinner's prayer. There are others of you tonight who did not come to the front, but you want to pray this prayer. You pray it out loud with me. And then after the meeting, you'll have to confess it sooner or later. So maybe tomorrow night you'll do it. But God bless you. Let's pray the sinner's prayer, shall we? Close your eyes, everybody. When Jesus hung on the cross, he prayed his half because it is a covenant, you see. Two people must be involved. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And as you pray your half tonight, you'll be saved by the grace of God. Won't be signed with a signature. Won't be the shaking of a hand. It'll be sealed with the precious blood of Christ, the Lamb of God. Out loud after me. Counselors, help them through with the prayer. Do not mumble. Speak loudly as you say your covenant prayer to Jesus. Here we go. Lord Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ. I come to you tonight. Because I, am a sinner. because I am a sinner. Tonight, Lord Jesus, Tonight, Lord Jesus I, repent of my sin. I repent of my sin. I turn away from my sin. I turn away from my sin. And, I turn to Jesus. and I turn to Jesus. I believe, dear Lord, I believe, dear Lord you, died for me. you died for me. Your blood covers my sin. And I thank you now. I open the door to my heart. Come in, Lord Jesus. Wash me and cleanse me. Make me your child. As I receive you by faith. I close the door now. With Jesus inside. Help me to live for you every day until you come again. I thank you, Lord Jesus. Tonight I have received you in the presence of these witnesses and you have received me. I love you and praise you for saving me tonight. Me tonight. Dear, Father, Dear Father, in Jesus' name. In Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Keep your eyes closed and hear the promise from God's word. John chapter 1 verse 12. Listen. But as many as received him, that's Jesus, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. That includes ladies as well as men. Look at me tonight, dear ones. And I'm saying to you, it's uh, 20 to 10, uh, so we've got to be off the property at 10. But I'm saying to you at 20 to 10, welcome to the family of God. Amen. Give them a hug. Give these people a hug. Give these people a hug, everybody. Give them all a greeting. Praise the Lord. Lovely. Listen, just in case, is there anybody out there who knows somebody here you really want to give them a hug? Who knows somebody up here, please? You're allowed to get out of your seat. Give them a quick hug. Come on. Just, just a couple of minutes. There's joy in the presence of the angels over one sinner that repents. Give your friends a welcome. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Give them a welcome, everybody. Let them through, please. Let the friends through to hug their friends. Lovely. Now listen, if you can all listen to me for a moment. Could the congregation not leave the meeting, please, because these folks are going to go out through the door in a minute, and we don't want a big jam up there. You've got to let them go through the door. Everybody will receive one of these from me. It's called a new birth certificate. What time did you receive Jesus? 9.40 p.m. And the date is the, the 18th of May, 2002. You sign your name on the card. You glue it in your Bible. You'll never forget this night. You're the first man out, right? You'll get the first card.
God bless you. Uh, I want to say this to all of you tonight. This is the beginning only. Please try not and talk. Try and listen to what I'm saying. Excuse me. This is the beginning tonight. It's not the end. You get cracking as from tonight, born again, and then you start to live for Christ. How do I live for the Lord? Number one, it's on the card. Pray daily. Every morning, open the curtains. Good morning, Lord Jesus. Good morning, Father. It's not a religion. It's a relationship. I'm going to walk with you today. You're my heavenly Father now. I'll share my joys and sorrows with you. Talk to him all through the day. Number two, get yourself a good Bible and read it regularly, starting in the Gospel of John. talks about salvation and everlasting life. Remember the rules, everybody? Dirty Bible, clean Christian. Clean Bible, dirty Christian. Everybody look at their neighbor's Bible. And you've got to tell your friends it's a brand new one. That's what you say. <laughs> okay, number three. Listen, tell your friends tomorrow night is a very exciting one. We start at 6.30 tomorrow night. And I'm going to explain the 666 for Rome. I didn't give it to you tonight because I ran out of time. Tomorrow night I'll explain the 666 system for Rome and, and, and other stuff you need to hear because tomorrow night will be the capping of the whole thing, like a capstone, all right? So don't miss that one. So be there at the service. Tell your friends the mark of the beast is coming, the chip's already out and all that sort of stuff, the Antichrist is getting ready, world government is here, Australia is being sold overseas, their only security is in Jesus. Amen. And number four, listen, find a good church and go to it regularly. If you go to a church where your minister is not born again, leave it. And if you're not sure if he is, ask him. And if he gets angry, he's not. <laughs> you must go to a church where the minister is saved. Then he can help you. The Bible says, if the blind man leads the blind, you all fall in the ditch. So you must make sure he's born again. And if you have nowhere to go and you live in this area, come here and learn the ways of God. There is a very precious man of God here, Pastor Norm Armstrong. Amen. Sister Ruth over here, lovely people. God bless you. And I tell you, listen, uh, I'm an expert, everybody. I'm in a different church every week. We've done about 40 years of this now. A different church every week. I know what I'm talking about. This is a good one. Good one, brother. He's, a, he's, he's an old timer like myself. So God bless you. Fellowship much more as you see the day approaching. Now, I'm going to stand over here. Don't go out first. Let these people go first. Can I shake hands with these dear people? And then you follow just out that way for a moment. Have a word of prayer. Go home rejoicing in Jesus' name. I want to shake your hand give you a card. Pastor, take over now, please. Pastor Ruth. All right. As they're going over to the counselling room to receive their commitment pack, amen, let's, let's give them a big clap as they go. That's right. And we will sing Amazing Grace, his favourite song. We better not sing it too loud because they want to hear what he has to say. But let's sing it and be in the spirit. You ready? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound of that saved a wretch like me. Same verse again, Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace. Bless your brother. Now that say, I'm rich like me. I was lost, lost, but now I'm found. I was blind. Was grace to us grace, and then sing it. Oh, my heart to be and grace, my fears relieve. Our precious dear, of that grace of me. Hasn't it been a 
been a great night tonight. Let's give the Lord a hand clap. Hallelujah. Fascinating talk, Barry. I enjoyed it immensely. Yes, praise God. <clears throat> uh, how many enjoyed it tonight? Look at all those hands, yes. And we're so grateful for you for coming to Australia this time and to this church. Tomorrow night is the final meeting, and don't forget it's 6.30. <clears throat> it has been a most exciting time for me as the pastor to see for a 7.30 meeting the place nearly full at quarter to seven. Amen. <laughs> I'm going home to pray. <laughs> oh, it's wonderful. God bless you. We thank you for coming. And you're a lovely lot of people. And turn around to somebody and say, it was such a joy sitting next to you tonight. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Well, we're going to stand and sing the last verse when we've been there 10,000 years. Now, don't move for a moment. Let's all stand. I've got something else to say. As I said last night, don't lose your sanctification be here, between here and the front gate. Just watch our traffic men and be gracious. Maybe you'll have to wait a minute or two. And let's all sing the last verse now and then go out quiet. Anybody that's double parked and you're the one that's causing the double park, well, we'll let you go out now where we're singing. All the double park people, amen. And that's right. Okay, when we did that, time is going to come. That's called the tribulation. The tribulation is not seven years in length, it is only three and a half. And so therefore we reckon that on this, Noah was saved before the flood. Lot was saved before the fire. The believers will be saved before the tribulation. Good news. Now some of you don't believe that, so praise the Lord anyway. Some people believe Jesus comes before the seven years. If you believe that, you're a pre-tribulationist. Some people believe he comes in the middle. If you believe that, you're called a mid-tribulationist. Some people believe he comes after the seven years. If you believe that, you're called a post-tribulationist. I said to a friend of mine once, the funny thing is, each of these groups is perfectly sure that they are correct. And my friend said, of course they are, otherwise they'd join the other group. <laughs> so the question is, because each of these groups is perfectly sure they are correct, they all have Bible verses to prove the point. Who is correct? The key word is wait. If you're still here three or four days after the peace treaty is signed, that's the end of that view. <laughs> wait humbly with me. <laughs> For halfway through, if Jesus doesn't come back there, I will have to write letters all around the world. Apologizing. And then we wait for another three and a half years. If he doesn't come there, we're doomed. <laughs> but the praise of the Lord, he is coming, everybody. Amen. And from the moment the peace treaty is signed, within seven years, he will come back again. That's the key to the whole deal. So please take those home with you. If you even if you don't intend to come, there's a picture of my wife and I on there. You might enjoy that. <laughs> I want to give a very special greeting tonight to a very uh, precious man of God here, Pastor Leo Polo. This man here started the Assemblies of God among the Samoans, and he's got 40 churches going in this country. He's done well for Jesus. Get up, brother, and let the people give you a clap. Yeah. And he's worked hard, and God has blessed him. And the other thing is, he's part of my family. So bless you, brother. Now, tonight, we're going to turn in our Bibles in just a moment. But before we do, I want to say this, that when you travel around like I do, you've got to keep yourself in shape. That's why I, I really appreciate those of you who go to the gym. Is there anybody here who works in the gym? Where are you? God bless, only one person. <laughs> when you travel like this, we can't, you see, we can't go to gymnasiums, that's impossible. So my grandmother, at the age of 65, began to walk five miles every day. Now she's 87, we don't know where she is. <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.
Né? I see a lot of young people here tonight. It's nice to see young folks here. Who's under the age of 30, please? Now, if you're taking notes, write this down. This is sensible, what I'm saying now. My father told me this. By the time you reach the age of 30, make up your mind what you're going to do. Because Jesus was 30 when he started his public ministry. The first 30 years of preparation to decide what you're going to do. So make sure you set your sails in the right direction and God will bless you. Praise God, everybody. I heard of a young university student who rang his father one day. He said, Dad, he said, I'm almost finished university. I'm graduating next week. And he said, I'd like uh, to have a motor car. There's an unwritten rule in this university that the moment somebody graduates, Dad buys them a car. I need wheels. That's what he said. So the father said, I'll, I'll buy you a car, son, on two conditions. Number one, that you get all A-grade passes. And number two, you get a haircut. So the next week came and the boy rang up. He says, Dad, I'm ready to go down Parramatta Road to get a car. And the father said, OK, son. He said, have you fulfilled the conditions? The boy said, I've got all A-grade passes. And he said, yes, son, but I don't think you've had a haircut, have you? He said, listen, Dad, you read the Bible and you know there are men like Abraham, Moses, and possibly even Jesus. They probably had long hair. And the father said, well, possibly that's true, son. But remember this, they walked everywhere. <laughs> Here we go. Everybody ready, please? Pens and papers ready. On the 12th of September last year, some of you will remember exactly where you were. It was the 11th in America, but because New Zealand is ahead, we're right on the international date line, and you folks are two hours behind us here. Uh, we were woken about 2 o'clock in the morning. A friend of mine called from the Gold Coast, and he said, turn on CNN. There's uh, something happened in New York. And so I turned on CNN, and my wife and I sat up and looked, and we watched. We saw the two planes coming. Uh, one hit the tower, and then about an hour later, the other one hit the tower. And when I saw that happen, I heard the commentator mention the word one hour, and I shouted, Revelation 18. Turn with me, please. So we now turn to Revelation 18, and we read in chapter 18, verse 2. If you have a King James Bible, read with me, please. Here we go. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen. And has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Now, if you were in the meeting last night, it's very difficult for me to do these meetings because some people only come for one night. It's a, and it's a series, you see, so the background is very important to understand. If you look at the Bible, you'll see that at a certain time in history, uh, there was a man called John who wrote down the book of Revelation. So very quickly tonight, I'll just call out some questions for you and you Bible students can answer. Here we go. Who was the author of the book of Revelation? I'll just, I'll put it up here then. We'll put God for a start. Now, we'll call it once more. Who was the author of the book of Revelation? Okay, and he gave it to? He gave it to Jesus. Now, we'll just ask, who did Jesus give it to? All together, please. The angel. Good. And who did the angel give it to? It's got to be John this time. <laughs> Some people said John four times, so we, we will now turn to Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, and we will correct our theology. Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, altogether, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass, and he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. So there were four people involved in the writing of the book of Revelation. Now, can someone tell me, please, the island he was banished to? Patmos. I've been there a number of times. We've preached this message on the beach at Patmos, which is in one of the Greek islands. I've stood on the beach, exactly as John did, when he saw these things revealed in a vision. Who can tell me the year the book of Revelation was written? Somebody, it's not a trick. 96 AD, thank you. And what was prophesied in 96 AD is happening in the year 2002. 
Our message is right up to date. Now, if you look here, let's good evening. Special greeting to um, those of you who have travelled. Who's travelled for a long way to come to this meeting? Out of Sydney somewhere. Where from? Right? Campbelltown. That's not out of Sydney. I, I... <laughs> Wollongong, that's good. Excellent. God bless those folks. Oh, you can't trick me. I know a bit about this place. Yes. So I want to say tonight, thank you very much again to Pastor Norman. Where is he? Just up there, is he? And to those of you in the overflow, good evening, everybody. You're not that fit, come on. Well, I'll try it again. Good evening, everybody. No, the overflow. Good evening, everybody. No, be quiet. I'm listening to the overflow. I'm trying to hear the overflow call again. Once more, good evening, everybody. Oh, that was hopeless. <laughs> Anyway, praise the Lord. God bless. Those of you who have come for the first time tonight, we have the uh, books and so on and on the book table. They're selling out very quickly. So those of you who do not have opportunity to get them, we would suggest that you uh, get on the internet if you have a friend with the internet or you have it yourself. And this is our website address. So the books, tapes and so on are available there. Warning, second warning, final notice, P.S., better than Nostradamus, the devil's jigsaw, in which is the picture of the twin towers that we wrote, we drew uh, three and a half years before it took place. In fact, I'll show you. Here it is here. So I suggest that you get the devil's jigsaw along with better than Nostradamus, which has 25 reasons why America is mentioned in Bible prophecy. There it is. Notice the... Um, the Twin Towers, there you'll see the aeroplane flying, the word anthrax in the sky. All that was done three and a half years before the event took place. And I have newspapers and television people calling me from all over the world to know how I got that. It's all scriptural, you see. So we'll deal with a little bit of that tonight and some other things as well. So have your pen and paper ready, please. We have a good night ahead. Uh, if you'd like to subscribe to the Omega Times, our newspaper, we put this out every month. Seems to have lost it. It's... Uh, the Omega Times comes out every month with many, many articles in about Bible prophecy. We will bring you up to date. Please subscribe to that on a piece of paper with your address and phone number, and I'll take it back to New Zealand and send it to you. Anybody like to join us on the Israel trip this year? Middle East trip? Take the brochure with you, please. If everything looks all right, we'll go. Listen, I'm as keen to stay alive as you are. And if it looks a bit dicky, we won't be going. But if it's all right, we'll be going. So I'm, I've been asking the Lord, I've been 18 times already, and I've been asking the Lord, I want to be there when the peace treaty is signed. We're looking for a seven-year peace treaty between the Jews and the Arabs. There must be a seven-year treaty confirmed by a man called Antichrist. Your scripture for that is Daniel 9, 27. says this, He shall confirm the covenant with many for one week which in the Hebrew language is the word heptad. And in the midst of the week, he will cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. If you look on the chart over there, look around gently, so you won't need to see a chiropractor after the meeting. <laughs> You'll see over there, 20, question mark, question mark. He will confirm the covenant with many, that's all the Arab nations and Israel, for seven years. Daniel 9, 27. In the midst of the week... He will cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. In other words, because he will be a non-religious Jewish uh, antichrist, this man <coughs> will help Israel, and then halfway through he will break the covenant, and then it says a very bad time. Your scriptures for the mark of the beast, Revelation chapter 13, verses 16 to 18, and we've already spoken about the mark of the beast. It is a silicon chip, that's all. And did you know that people are now lining up for the chip? It's out this year. Have a look at this one. There are 5,000 people with their names on the list hoping to receive the mark of the beast. Already. Some of you haven't been in the meetings, but you need to know this. Look at it. People queue up for computer chip implants. The chipping ceremony will be held in the U.S. state of Florida and will be uh, performed by Applied Digital Solutions, the Florida technology company. The chips called VeriChip are rice grain sized devices that sit under the skin. When scanned by a special reader, the chip emits a radio signal that will transmit a code which is linked to secure databases. 
They're going to link them up to satellites shortly so they can trace these people around the world. That's, that's the beginnings of the mark of the beast. They will finally cancel cash. We've learned this already. As our poster says here, here's an empty wallet upside down laughing. Let's read it together. Welcome to the cashless society. Over here, welcome to the cash society. Over here, welcome to the cashless society. And when the cash is cancelled, they are ready, they've started already through a group called Applied Digital Solutions to bring in the mark of the beast as spoken of in Revelation chapter 13, verses 16 to 18. Let's, let's listen to it. And he, referring to the Antichrist, causes all, both rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. And we know what the number is altogether, 666. Six, six. And so we've dealt with all that. We haven't got time to do it again tonight. Let's read a bit more. That's verse um, 12. We notice in the Bible, there are, a lot, there are four lots of ten mentioned there, and all of these refer to the inner tier of the common market. Tony Blair is saying that they will have the, and ten nations come together for full political and monetary union in the centre, tier, T-I-E-R, and the outer tier probably will be made up of 18. We have 15 nations in the market already, 13 applying to join. That'll make 28. And the, eight are, the 18 on the outside tier will be controlled by the inner tier. The Word of God calls them by four lots of 10. There are 10 horns in the book of Daniel, chapter 7, 10 crowns, 10 kings, and 10 toes on the image in Daniel, chapter 2. That's the inner tier, and we're living in the days. And the good news is, Jesus is coming. Amen. My job is almost finished. And I can stay home and cut the grass. I'm a dangerous man on a mower. Did you know that? I heard my son laughing the other day. I said, what are you laughing at? He was telling the, the visitors about my latest adventure. I have a lot of adventures. And I was on the ride on mower. We live on 25 acres uh, on the top of the South Island. And I was on this ride on mower, mowing near a swing, a kid's swing. I had it hanging, a rope hanging from a branch on a tree. And I was too lazy to get off and shift it. And the next minute, I found myself hanging up. It, it lifted the mower right off the ground. I was swinging up the tr I'm on the mower, still sitting on the seat. It happened very quickly. Life is very exciting. Let's read verse 12 together. All together. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. There's another piece of information. How long will the common market last? A short space. When they get their leader, how long will it last? One hour. Now, I thought about this for some time, you see. Prophetically speaking, one day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand. Turn to Revelation 17, and we're going to read a scripture there in verse 10. And I'm going to move fairly quickly tonight because there is just so much information. Revelation 17.10. The Apostle John is writing in 96 AD under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. And God shows him that there will be seven very powerful empires that will run the Gentile world. So let's read together, shall we? Verse 10. And there are seven kings, five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. Now, some of you went to school. You remember while you were at school, you learned your verb tenses. Past tense, next one. Present tense, next one. Future tense. Today I run. Yesterday I... Tomorrow I will run. In this particular case, which empire was ruling when John wrote down the book of Revelation? Rome. So I put a circle around Rome. And now we can read this verse intelligently. Let's read it. There are seven kings. Would you call them out, please? One... Chaldees. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. European community is the final world empire. They already have the common currency. It came in this year. It affects the lives of 300 million people. It is called the euro, and they have yielded up their national currencies that they might be bound together because it is money that holds people together. Now watch this, everybody. Five are fallen. Past tense. He's looking back from this one. Let's go through. One, two. All together, folks. Come on. One, two. No, no. I'll say the, I'll say the numbers. You say the... 
you're having me on, you feel? This, is, this has got to be Australia. Number one, Chaldees. Two, Egypt. Three, Babylon. Four, Medo-Persia. Five, Greece. Is he correct? Yes, yeah, so we give him a tick. When I said that in America, they all laughed. I said, what are you laughing at? They said, a cow has ticks. <laughs> the Americans call that a check. A check for John. Get the idea? Then he says in the present tense, one is, that is Rome, is he correct? Yes. yes. And the other has not yet come. There's your European community. And when he comes, he must continue a short space. How long will the common market last? It started in power this year with their common currency. How long will it last? A short space. So I'll put that down here. Short space. And then we read the next verse about a great world leader who will arise. He's called Antichrist. And he's also called the Beast. He's called the Man of Sin and the Son of Perdition, which name was previously applied to another man in Bible history whose name was Judas Iscariot. Let's read about him. Verse 11. And the Beast that was, in other words, the devil that will inhabit this great world leader, was in Judas Iscariot and is not. In other words, in 96 AD, as John wrote all this down, he didn't know who he was. Even he is the eighth. There will be seven world empires, and then the eighth will be the leader. He is of the seven. In other words, he takes over the leadership of this seventh one, and he goeth into perdition. The same place that Judas Iscariot went is the same place this man will go. There's going to be a devilish man run the whole world shortly through the common market. He will sign a peace treaty in the Middle East, and he will be responsible with another man called the false prophet to bring in a new world money system called the mark of the beast. Would you write down the scriptures for all this, please? Leadership of the common market, Revelation 17, verses 10 to 12. Number two, the signing of the peace treaty between the Jews and the Arabs, Daniel chapter 9 and verse 27. 